What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games Podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff every Friday. I am Andrea Renee, joined by one Christine Steimer. Hello. One Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. And one Miss Rihanna Manuel. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Broke the street. Oh, she always does the hay, though. It's it's the re thing. It's her thing. It's, it's the re way. Uh, welcome to the show, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, whether it's your first episode or your 174th episode of What's Good Games. We are glad that you are here to talk to us about some video game news. Well, we'll be doing all of the talking. But <laughs> we've got a couple of announcements that we'd like to talk to you about. Speaking of which... Next week is going to be a very busy week for us, Brittany, over at Twitch, 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 Twitch.tv <laughs> slash What's Good Games. Starting on Monday, July 20th, the one and only Mary Kish is coming back to the show. We're super Woo! excited. So Mary was the very first guest that we ever had on What's Good Games. Aww. Throwback. Can wow. you even remember that far back? I can barely remember that far back. I just think about that old studio. And all the fond memories. We had some good times there. We sure did. <laughs> Kratos. And put a dick Kratos. on it. Pumpkin painting. Mm -hmm. Assassin's Crafts Creed wine tasting. Yeah. The wine tasting was the best part. It was. Do you want to drink a cat <laughs> hair? Yes, I do. Um, lots of good memories. Uh, so Mary will be on the show on Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And then on Wednesday, very special guest Felicia Day is going to be joining me for an Animal Crossing New Horizons tour. So I'm going to tour Felicia's Island and she's going to tour mine because we both thankfully were featured on IGN's Animal Crossing Celebrity Island tours. But by the time they aired those special episodes during their live stream when they were raising money, both Felicia and I were like, our islands are so much better now. We need to show the world. <laughs> and so we will show the world all of the progress that we have made since the beginning of June. And I'm excited to see where her island is at. So join us at 1 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesday for that. And then Brittany, Thursday is going to be a fun day. Oh, my goodness. It's the X. Xbox Live reacts with what's good games. Xbox is going to have a little thing where they're going to be showing some first party games. It's going to be fantastic. So we are going to be live streaming that at 9 a.m. on twitch.tv slash what's good games with special guest Zombie Kills. Yeah, she's, she's wonderful. I'm so excited to work with her and do stuff with her. I never have before. We've exchanged many tweets on Twitter and she seems really bubbly and energetic. And I'm really excited to do shit with her. It's going to be fun. And she was featured but in front of the show, Khalif Adams, A yes. Lesson in Blackness, which we promoted here um, a couple of weeks back. So I'm pumped to hear everything she has to say about Xbox. <sighs> Shall yeah. we have mimosas? Um, Ooh. Avi. <laughs> Ooh. I don't think I have any champagne, though. That's Good okay. news. You have that. a whole week to go get some. I do. Wow. Or you can have it delivered. I can. That's a better option. It is a better option. And then, of course, the Friday show will be back, um, you know, after you know, after it, as per normal. Um, and then we have some fun stuff coming up uh, even later in the month that we'll remind you guys about in the future. Um, Brittany, you also put up a fun little video over at YouTube.com slash What's Good Games this week. Yes, let me put on my bottle of whiskey. I'll take a sip of that in a second. Yeah, so <laughs> if you haven't been over to youtube.com slash what's good games, you should. I've been working on kind of organizing and picking up some fun clips from the past, stuff that dates back to 2017, from Alexa's Pokemon or Bullshit to Do You Want to Drink a Cat Hair? There's some, some fun stuff on there. So if you find yourself wanting more what's good content, because the Monday and Friday show and the in between streams aren't enough, go over to youtube.com slash what's good games. It's a good time. You'll find some good throwbacks. Also, a lot of our old Patreon segments were structured in a way that were exclusive to Patreon. Those were called secret segments, and those have all been made public now. So maybe you haven't seen them. Maybe our wine tasting videos or the video on how we met or our favorite video game romances. Ooh. 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 We did a sorting hat quiz, Steimer and I, way back in the day. That's on we there, did? too. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. forgot you about that. You don't remember? Of course. Do, of course, Clearly, I don't she remember. Doesn't remember. Of course, doesn't of course remember. I don't remember. My memory is that of a gnat. It is bad. Do you remember Bartholomew the gnat? I do remember Bartholomew. Oh, Bartholomew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The gnat. Um, I was actually referring to your five things to know before you play Ghosts of Tsushima. 
Oh, yeah, that's on there, too. Uh, (laughs) We're going to be talking about that, obviously, on this show. But, yeah, if I get a review copy and the embargo is a few days before the Friday show, I try to put up a little something-something on our channel so you can get a little sneak peek into my thoughts. So, yeah, right now on YouTube, you can find my Ghost of Tsushima Five Things You Should Know. Spoilers, I'm going to talk about those during this podcast. But still, go watch, subscribe, give us a click. We would appreciate it. Yeah, clicks. Um, thank you so much to our Patreon producers, Chewy's Godson, Alex Rogopoulos, Farrow Sate, Mohammed Mohammed, Marcus Brown, Punctified, and Molle Bittner, who is now once again a Southern California resident. Welcome back, yes, Molly. Girl. And welcome, back, welcome Molly. yes, welcome back. And welcome for the first time to our Patreon community, Marianne Holloway, Strauss Thal, Damian Marr, Tim Tweed, Silver Samurai, Alan Cantu, Jesse Rome, Anthony Shabelli, Cybelli, and... Anna Harris, Dylan Doyle, Robert Beck, Nigel Tunson, and Stephen Carpenter. And Brittany, we have got a slew of new podcast reviewers. Yes. I want to thank everyone because I think that last comment where someone left me a one-star review saying I was an alcoholic and so obnoxious. I think a lot of you came raw into the cause. So thank you. JJess84, Rob Hayes, Starfang7, Space Man Lazy, uh, Aramaic80, Aramia, I, I, uh, D1 Wayne, Decept3 Up. All two of RHCP, Hype Spaceball, got these names, Smart Celt, Babushka underscore two, I think that's my favorite, ADHLX, Damned <laughs> Alcatraz, <laughs> Ty Olwyn, BDEM32, and Optional Moron. Thank you all. You are all <laughs> enablers of Britney's drinking. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Appreciate it. All rock. No, it, it really does help us a lot, and we really do see the impact of these reviews in our algorithms, specifically in iTunes. So, thank you so much for leaving these five star reviews. I read them all. They're I read. Very kind. I read almost all of them too. And like some of you wrote some very kind, lovely, nice things. Mm-hmm. So, thank you, especially when times are tough. Going to read really nice sentiments is is it's 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 nice, you guys. Yeah. It feels oh. good. Okay, um, enough about that. Let's get into the news, shall we? But before we do that, I want to let you know this week's news segment is brought to you by Bespoke Post. If your mailbox is anything like mine, 90% of the time, it's a fairly depressing place. Political flyers, utility bills, unholy amounts of coupons. But once a month, folks do have a reason to be stoked, and that's because their box of awesome from bespoke post has arrived so we have talked about box of awesome here at what's good games before and talked about steimer's amazing moscow mule cups and my fancy leather pad but let me tell you if you haven't checked out some of their newest boxes i highly recommend one of the ones that caught my eye is called island it's got these super cute little pineapple tumblers and comes with this passion fruit syrup perfect for making some summer cocktails i might add And no matter what you are into, if it's not summer cocktails, Box of Awesome has you covered. From style and grooming goods to barware, cooking tools, and outdoor gear, Box of Awesome has carefully built collections for every part of your life. To get started, you got to take a quiz at boxofawesome.com. Your answers will help them pick out the right box of awesome just for you. They release new boxes every month across a ton of different categories. Plus, it's free to sign up, and you can skip any month or cancel any time. Each box costs only 45 bucks, but has over $70 worth of gear inside. Like that sweet HO box that's got the mortar and pestle so you can make some homemade guac and tacos. <sighs> Who doesn't love a good taco night, right? We all like tacos. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. To get started, you've got to go to boxofawesome.com and use the promo code WGG for 20% off your first box. That is Box of Awesome for 20% off your first monthly box when you sign up. Boxofawesome.com, enter code WGG at checkout for 20% off your first box. So the news this week is a little all over the place. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But I think what we want to start, Brittany, you put this in here, is with some of the reviews that came out for Ghosts of Tsushima and a game I completely forgot about, but I'm very excited about Paper Mario, the Origami King. Yes. So these games are coming out Friday, July 17th. Which means it's today because that's when you're listening to the show. (laughs) Yes, baby girl. Thank you. You you got me. 
I love you for that. <laughs> so yes, these games are out today. If you're watching or listening on July 17th. So Ghost of Tsushima is currently sitting at an 84 on Metacritic. And obviously we're going to have some deep dive impressions because Steimer, Bree, and I have been playing. And Andrea will be playing on Friday? Yes. Maybe? Yes. The plan yes. is to start a stream from the very beginning of the game. Uh, we Ooh. had always mentioned that uh, Brittany and Steimer were going to be the two to play this game. And then, thankfully, PlayStation provided us additional codes for Rihanna and myself. And so we put, Thanks, sunk some, some good time in. And I was like, you know what? Maybe, just maybe, I'll start streaming from the very beginning. Because I don't think I've ever done that for a game. Mm. Mm. Well, I can't wait to watch you play it. Oh, yeah. Gosh. Yeah, yeah, TV yeah, slash yeah, yeah, yeah. games. Okay, Brittany, continue. Okay, yeah. So uh, 84, which is going to, it's going to be a fun conversation to have. It's kind of one of those games that's all over the place. I think some people really enjoy the open world asset aspect. Some people fit like it's really bloated. Some people like Re and I, I don't know about you, Simon, we haven't touched base, think it's game of the year. It's a game of the year contender. Some people are like, it's awful. Anyway, excited <laughs> to talk about that and hands on. But the other game is Paper Mario, the Origami King, which is currently sitting on an 81 on Metacritic. And I pulled three little blurbs from IGN, Eurogamer, and Polygon, and I kind of reiterate the same, the same critiques of this game, but nonetheless, I shall read on. So IGN says, The Origami King is a truly likable game despite the shallowness of its new spin on gameplay. Its characters are winsome, its visual design is gorgeous, its world is fun to explore, and its storytelling is outside the box and playful. At the same time, however, it could be so much more. Combat is largely unfilling, unfulfilling, and your journey as a whole lacks meaningful choices. Eurogamer says, there's plenty I'd recommend about the Origami King, a, a journey generous with its humor, its spread of locations, it, its continual sense of adventure in Mario's bid to defeat the evil Origami King. But I expected it to grow the shoots it had begun to set out and dig a little deeper. For all of the game's sense of personality and place, it never grows into anything weightier. And finally, Polygon says, the game is a delight most of the time and is often too simple as I spend my time running around talking to other characters and giggling at the silly wordplay expected from a Paper Mario release. But the 10% or so of the game made up of combat encounters and boss fights makes me absolutely miserable. Oh, no. <laughs> if it's only 10%. That doesn't seem that bad. Ten <laughs> percent miserable. Ten percent like misery. A for eight, like you know, ninety percent happy seems fine. Yeah, I feel like that's actually a really good ratio for this year. Yeah, right? that's actually not a bad point when yeah. you put but it in I'm, perspective. I'm yeah. To play this. yeah, it looks like a super just cute, chill Paper Mario game. I don't think any of us expect a blockbuster hit from Paper Mario. I wouldn't expect uh, any weight from a game called Paper Mario. Ah, but oh I'm... snap! <laughs> good one, Steamer. <laughs> I got nothing. Let's just move on. Like, okay. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> okay, oh moving God. on. Reggie fils has been appointed to Rogue Games as an advisor, joining ex-Sony president Jack Trenton. This is going to get juicy. I'm so interested <laughs> in this. I saw the name <laughs> Jack, and I, start, I was like, what? Jack Trenton? I thought he was just <laughs> golfing now. What's this guy doing? Apparently, he and Reggie might be golfing together. Oh. All right. Uh, sure according, to, uh, according to IGN, publisher Rogue Games has appointed ex-Nintendo of America president Reggie fils as a strategic advisor to its board just a month after it appointed ex-Sony Computer Entertainment America president Jack Trenton to a similar role. Announced in a press release, fils will serve as a strategic advisor to the board of directors. Rogue is currently active moving, actively moving into console publishing, and the ex-Nintendo executive will offer his expertise in that area. When Rogue shared its console vision with me and I saw the first games that will be arriving this summer on the platform like Nintendo Switch I was immediately impressed by the level of ambition and innovation said Reggie fils -Aimé. I'm always on the lookout for fast growing and innovative companies that are ready to shape the future of games and I'm excited to join Rogue in their mission to unite and simplify games publishing across the platform last month Jack Trenton who as we said, worked at Sony for 19 years before stepping down in 2014, also joined Rogue as a strategic advisor and will advise on the company's planned move into publishing on next-gen consoles. It leaves Rogue with an unusually notable set of advisors as it makes its move into the console markets. IGN will be showing off one of those console games later today. Ooh. Brit note. That game is called Under, and it is a PT-like horror game coming to PC, Switch, and Xbox, and PlayStation in Q4 of 2020. No, thank you. Uh, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> uh, Rogue previously published a number of games on Apple Arcade, including Super Impossible Road, which we said in IGN's review, uh, for a dash of F-Zero. 
gives super impossible row to try. Ugh. That's not a very definitive no, statement what whatsoever. I don't that know feels what that a means. Vague, IGN. <laughs> um, so uh, I feel like this is both interesting and not interesting at the same time because a strategic advisor doesn't really have a lot of power. Do you get paid? Yes, usually. What a weird I'm concept to me. I just would be like, is this for bagels? Like, what is, <laughs> like, why? What are you doing? <laughs> I, don't, I don't, someone bagels. needs to explain head honcho world to me. Cause it's, but you know, he always seemed nice. Jack Trent was always nice. He always said hello to me. That's all I got. Aww. Well, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. I don't really know much about rogue as a company, but having both of those guys as advisors and attached to your brand, regardless of how much they actually influence what happens at the company, just like the optics of it is, is good. It's good for business. Good for yeah. business. Yeah, like the article said, they primarily focus on Apple Arcade and Google Play Pass. So it sounds like they're just trying to make that transition over to console games. And they have two big wigs to help them get there. Reggie's been a little busy guy lately. He's now doing this. He was, what, he's on the board of advisors for GameSpot. Stop. GameStop. GameStop. It's always a you know, tongue twister there. Yeah, and then here. No, I was just saying, I'm so glad they didn't get him. <laughs> See, and I, I was just thinking, guy. I'm waiting for the announcement no. of Don Matrick. <laughs> no, if they get Don Matrick, I will not believe in them anymore. <laughs> oh my God, could you imagine? That would be a very interesting trinity of folks to acquire. <laughs> I feel like if I was allowed to slap somebody with no repercussions, it would be Don Matrick. <laughs> I didn't know this about you. You're harboring some <laughs> deep-seated ill will. I, uh, I have my reasons. <laughs> okay. okay. Reasons. I do actually and have finally, reasons. <laughs> I'm sure you yeah. know. And then finally, in <laughs> like, September, Reggie joined the Video Games Critics Circle, which I didn't know about. Maybe you covered it, but sometimes I have the memory of an at like Simer. It's an organization with a mission of mentoring young people in undeserved un underserved communities I was like, like undeserving. Like, no, no, no. I was like, that is not right. Let me reread that again. Underserved communities like the Bronx and Lower East Side and offering them scholarships and internships. So Reggie's keeping himself busy. Good job, Reggie. Reggie seems like a nice person. I still think yeah. one of these I want him to sell me a car before I before I die. Sell you, a, sell car? you a car? Sell me a car. I feel like he's like the most he looks like a car salesman. I feel like he could just sell me anything on the lot and he'd be like, yes, sir, I will buy that. I think he could definitely run a used car lot if uh, you like make all of the cars Nintendo themed. What if they were, <laughs> what if it was like a Mario Kart car lot? Oh, yes. And it would be like, Reggie's here to sell you some cars. <laughs> I don't know Absolutely. why I did that voice. but uh, Just like that. Okay. No, that, that's what I want. I really want that. Brittany's like, why. take my money. Why no? My money. Why you know? There's the Nintendo World in Japan. They there could just go, have him. Girl. They could just pay him to like shoot a video, and they just play it on like the jumbotron. <laughs> <laughs> why not? I'm into it. Why not? I'm into it. No, I. Do the it. new Nintendo assistant is Reggie's voice. <laughs> I feel so bad because I've met Reggie a few times. A very, very, very nice man. But I feel like every time I see him, I'm usually tipsy or like just super like hyper about something. I'm like, Reggie, whoa! Wait, and isn't the night we took the photo with him at E3 when we were leaving the Twitch party or something? That was one of the moments. Yes, absolutely. Oh, that was it. Oh, man. We like walked outside <laughs> And we saw Reggie waiting to get into a car. He's like, I'm just trying to leave. <laughs> we were, I don't even remember who we were with because I wouldn't have done it. Because at that point, I had had too many drinks. So I was like, no, no, no. I have to maintain professional injury every night. I can't go talk to Reggie fils right now. And this girl that we were with, I'll have to look up the photo, was like, Reggie! Reggie! And I was like, oh, no. And then he was like, hello. And she's like, can we take a photo? He was like, of course. He was so nice. I was like, so I'm nice. so sorry, Reggie. We're not this drunk, I promise. Oh, he was we like, so it's fine. <laughs> sure, we can take a photo. Oh my god! It and was... then I'm gonna get in this cab and eat a pizza. That's like how I imagine the rest of his night went. <laughs> yeah. He was like, "Oh, kids these days." Yeah, probably. <laughs> He's like, "What must that be like to have fun it. at these events?" <laughs> exactly. Yeah, like a six foot something dude just hunched over in the back of a cab eating pizza. Like those girls. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Silly kids. Yeah. That's Oh, Reggie. Okay. Um, moving on to the kind of beefier news of the week. Let me put in air quotes the beefier news of the week. <laughs> this is like I can't believe it's not beef version of beef. Oh, <laughs> pretty much. Um, can you Spam. tell that we have a tiny bit of shade? Um, Stadia Connect happened this week. Did you miss it? I did. Well, you didn't yeah. miss much. Um, 
this is just a brief rundown of everything that was announced and shown uh, via IGN. So, of course, Google hosted a brand new Stadia Connect on July 14th and revealed 15 new games coming to the digital streaming platform, including... Are they actually new? Da, 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 five exclusives. <gasps> oh. So here they are. Outcasters, only on Stadia, exclusive, is coming from developer Splash Damage and returns with a competitive online multiplayer game set in a vinyl world. Orcs Must Die 3, only on Stadia and playable in Stadia Pro today, is one of the first exclusive announcements for Stadia. Orcs Must Die 3 is playable today for Stadia Pro users. Now, I think I need to look this up. Didn't Orcs Must Die 3 come out on PC, though? So Orcs Must Die 1 and 2 are obviously tower defense. The second one introduced co-op. The third one is when they tried to Orcs Must Die Unchained is what it was technically called. Oh. And it was more of like a... Oh, I don't know, MOBA, MOBA style? i not entirely sure. I played it several years ago, and essentially it got scrapped. And I think it may be an actual release. Either way, it did not perform well. And now they're going back to Orcs Must Die 3, which from my understanding is a return back to Orcs Must Die 2. Kind of an extension of that, which I'm actually really excited about. I love Orcs Must Die. That's probably the only thing I'm excited about from this, from this <laughs> lineup. And I thought it was a timed exclusive, but this makes it seem like it's a... Stadia exclusive. I think it probably is. It's very rare that we get exclusives on console that are like forever exclusives. And it's usually pretty clear from yeah. the beginning that they are like, there was no question that like Spider-Man was going to only be on PlayStation. Right. Like, yeah, that was forever. only going to be that thing. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on it, but it's currently sitting at a 76% on Metacritic, which is yeah. not a, Bad score, but it's not a great score. So it's like a, a little tower defense. It's an yeah, average score. Yeah. Um, Super Bomberman R Online is coming first to Stadia in the fall of 2020. A new online Bomberman game coming to Stadia is designed for multiplayer Bomberman gameplay, including new Battle Royale mode for up to 64 <laughs> players. Bomberman. Wait, I, what? Bomberman I Battle Royale? Some, <laughs> some Bomberman back in the day on Super Nintendo. Sure. That was my jam. But uh, Bomberman Battle Royale, that is... That is a thing. That's a choice. That someone a made. Choice. Someone <laughs> decided to around. make that. Yeah. You just like run around with a whole bunch of dudes in a little robot costume, just like chucking bombs everywhere. Is that like I mean, how that this would sounds go down? Fun. You know, I, I mean? like throwing bombs. So Steimer <laughs> is going to do the review of Bomberman Battle Royale. Oh no! Check. I gave up. Perfect. I gave up Thank doing you, bullshit you. reviews when you. I left okay, IGN. Next we have one hand clapping. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice! I see what you did there, Brittany. Go ahead, take it away. Okay, we have one hand clapping. Which I was going to demonstrate, and then I realized. <laughs> Wait a kind minute. Of? It's almost like you can't clap with one hand. You can. <laughs> I guess technically, yeah. If some people can do it really well, actually. Like, they can actually make a sound with it. I can't really like do it. Like, when you, like. Yeah, they, like, do it really fast. They, like, just flick their hand oh, back God. and forth. But it hurts my joints. I don't have the Ugh. mobility or speed for it. <laughs> too old for that shit. Anywho, that is a 2D puzzle platformer where you sing into your headset to solve musical puzzles. This sounds All like right. a game for me. Yeah, actually, the more I'm reading about it, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Okay, then we have NBA 2K21 Fall 2020. This is the next NBA. We already know what that is. Who cares? Uh, Dead by Daylight, cross-play with all platforms, cross-progression with Switch and PC. Player Unknown's Battleground Season 8. Hitman 1, 2, and 3, which Ooh. is coming in January Uno, dos, 2021. Tres, cuatro, cinco, cinco, yes. There you Ooh. go. Nice call. Serious Sam 4. Stadia and PC only at launch August 2020. Outriders, Google Stadia in 2021. WWE 2K Battleground, September 18th. PGA Tour 2K21, August 21st. Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice, Fall 2020. Hmm. Hello Neighbor, September 20th. There. Are you well, all yeah. wanting to get a Stadia? Well, no. <laughs> um, no. <laughs> I think it's important to remind people, even though they didn't really mention it too much in the Stadia Connect, is that we have confirmed Cyberpunk 2077 is coming to Stadia. Uh, and Ubisoft confirmed that Watch Dogs Legion and Assassin's Creed Valhalla will also be coming to Stadia. Now, obviously, you can get those on any other platform as well. But I think that as we've discussed consoles with the exception of Nintendo, because, you know, they're doing their own thing. The third-party partnerships will be the thing that sell consoles. Like, I still, to this day, maintain that PlayStation 4 was the superior console in this generation because Sony put the money in the partnerships, right? And I think that Stadia is getting there, but they're not there yet. If your partnership 
flagship exclusive is Orcs Must Die 3, you got some work to do. Yeah. Very true. Yeah, I think, that's, I think you know, they're, they're taking some steps in the right direction. It's not there yet. Not saying it can't get there. But for now. Baby cool. steps. Yeah. They're doing exactly. some baby steps and that's fine. Exactly. They're still very, skate three. very new to the world. Yeah, exactly. And I just, I, I watched some of the reaction online after the connect earlier this week. And I think I just echo a lot of the sentiments that I saw from some of our peers in the video game media industry is that Stadia just feels like it launched a, a year or more too soon. Mm-hmm. This feels like they should have kind of held their cards a little bit longer and maybe announced Stadia now and then they could have launched with a much bigger library and then done like a beta period or they just launched an early access the way that Xbox Lounge has been doing with Project X Cloud to say, hey, we need time to work out some of the technological kinks because this is a very complicated thing that we're doing. And so we have this cool technology coming, but we're not going to launch. We're not going to start charging people money until we get all our ducks in a row. And they didn't do that. And so now and I if think anybody could afford it. It's Google. Yes. And they're yeah. now struggling this uphill battle against this like month after month after month of bad PR beats. And every time you talk to someone about Stadia, a lot of people that I know just kind of write it off. And it's frustrating because I've also seen some chatter from people who are big Stadia fans who are supporting Stadia and really want more games. And they're like, there's just not enough games for me on the platform to really keep justifying my pro subscription. Because now for people who bought the Founders Editions at the beginning, that free period is gone. And now they announced that, oh, they're dropping the box to $99.99, but doesn't include the three months of pro, I believe. So I'm just like, hmm. oh, boy. Oy vey. Let Oy me vey. It's tough to compete against all these subscription models in general, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you have Game Pass, you have PlayStation Plus. Like, if you're not giving people a lot for a little input or a little investment, like, there's really not a lot of room for you. So it'll just be interesting to see if they come around on that. Because taking something away from your consumer base is always a tricky move. And if you don't replace it with something equally or better value, it's a tough sell, especially for new people. Mm Mm-hmm. So yeah. yeah, I'm into Stadia for Orcs Must Die 3 and Baldur's Gate 3. Like those, that's enough. I really had a lot of fun with Orcs Must Die 2. Not enough to like hop on the Stadia right now. It's still in the box. <laughs> I still don't even think I've opened it from when I got it. Whoops. Hashtag founder. But when Baldur's Gate 3 rolls around, that'll be my test. Wait, so you're telling that's me you're one. not going to open your Stadia until Baldur's Gate? Yeah. Damn. Well, I mean, unless like a, we get a lull in games and I feel froggy and feeling a little adventurous, then I'll boost it up for Orcs Must Die. But I, that's just it. I have no reason to. Wow. Okay. Well, Damn. I think I, I, mean, okay. I think that speaks volumes. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, I've always said, not for me right now. It will be eventually. Baldur's Gate 3. Woo! You're just letting <laughs> that thing, you're players. letting it ferment in your closet for a little bit. You're letting it, yeah, letting it yeah. age. I'm letting it, yep, I'm letting it grow. I'm letting it ferment and fester a bit and mm-hmm. you know when i get it i'm gonna have probably a huge upgrade for it uh, that's not gonna be great anywho it's fine no here's the thing it's... you don't have to upgrade anything ever with stadia you yeah, just turn it on and it works kind that's of the, the whole, whole pitch oh, so there's no matter there won't be any like firmware updates or anything for anything anything well if you're using stadia on your television with the chromecast ultra there may be a firmware update for the Chromecast if you're literally waiting like a year since when you bought it to when you plug it in. But yeah, if you use Stadia be. on your phone or on a web browser, no. Yeah. No, it's because I'm only going to be playing it on my PC. I mean, sorry, my TV. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I'll report back and, oh, I don't know. Actually, the beta for Baldur's Gate is supposed to come out maybe, maybe August. Maybe. So if it does, we'll see. I might bust it out earlier. Well, I'm all right, bus, bus to move. But if it doesn't bus come out in August, Brittany, you know what else you can play in August? What, Andrea? The Marvel Avengers beta. Oh, shit. Segway. 
And Gadget writes that it's nearly time for the Avengers to assemble again. Crystal Dynamics has revealed that the beta launch dates for Marvel's Avengers is happening, but not everybody's going to get their hands on it at the same time. Players who pre-ordered Marvel's Avengers on PS4 specifically will get beta access first on August 7th. A week later, the Xbox One and PC pre-order beta gets underway, as does an open beta on PS4. And then on August 21st, the open beta will be live on all three platforms. Creator J- Creative director Sean Sky revealed to IGN the meaty beta will offer a taste of all aspects of the game. That includes the campaign, the progression system, and co-op modes. It also includes drop zones, a type of mission Crystal Dynamics hasn't said much about. It'll reveal more details about drop zones during the second War Table stream, which takes place on June 29th. July. That is correct. That month is July, Simer. At... 1 p.m. Eastern Time. You'll find out more about what's included in the beta then, too. The beta starts just a few weeks before the game hits PS4, Xbox One, Stadia, and PC on September 4th. Oh, so there's a game coming to Stadia. Uh, Also, (laughs) I I forgot that this game is out September 4th. What? Yeah. Oh, boy. At the very least, it'll give those who aren't yet convinced whether to pick up Marvel's Avengers some hands-on time to help them decide. Meanwhile, if you purchase a copy of P- on PS4 or Xbox One, it includes a free upgrade to the respective next-gen version. So if you buy it on PS4, you get it for free on PS5. Yeah, shout out to the free upgrade. I'm glad that they decided to do that, unlike some other publishers who have not. Yep. 2K, we're looking at you. Oh, snap. Mm-hmm. You've been called, called out. out. Bad move, friend. <laughs> Bad move. <laughs> it's just not a good look when everybody else is doing it. It's a really, it's a really greedy, it's a really greedy look. Take two. We know this is your fault. Take two, interactive. Fix it. It's true. Really but they're trying to money. take two. Literally, take twice. They're taking, uh, they're taking money I mean, twice. You gotta stop with these puns. I mean, I am on there. a roll today. I'm having a good time. Don't rain in my I parade. I love it. No, I say you gotta stop, but I don't really mean that. I'm basically okay, you mean keep going. going. Got it. Keep going. Yeah. It's like when so you pull, is anyone, pull is the anyone popcorn. Beta? Keep going. Yes. Wait, what? Are we interested? Is this, I'm, anyone playing this beta? Yes. I don't yeah. think I will, only because I do not like playing games I know I'm going to play before sure. they're out i just like it fatigues me and i don't like it oh well i'm definitely playing because i had a I ton of fun the game playing this back at pax east pax west, west last year it was w- west. West. west it was west was it i thought we played it at east west uh, a one whole the, year ago one of the paxes we played and it was super fun i remember the building it was west oh yeah oh. Summer's, it was west yeah <laughs> oh well, there you go mm-hmm. there you go mm-hmm. But it's time. Who Brittany, knows? I have some yeah. more exciting news, though. Oh, my God. Lay it on me like a thick blanket, girl. Let's go. Do you remember Ooh, like on Monday when we talked about that leaked rumor about the Nintendo Entertainment System that's coming to Lego? I do, Andrea. It's real. Oh, my God. And it's coming out on my birthday. <laughs> do you want me to buy it for you? It's $229. Pick something else. <laughs> <laughs> I'll so, buy you a cupcake instead <laughs> and put some icing on it that says NES and Lego equals I'll make heart. you a Microsoft Paint drawing, Andrea, of the, of the Lego set. Oh, I, I honestly would really love that. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> if you missed the news, there was a leak earlier this week that this really cool retro-styled Nintendo Entertainment System set from Lego was going to be dropping, and then Lego was like, you got us, it's real. And they released a video showcasing this set. It's basically a little mini TV with a little mini Nintendo Entertainment System and a little mini controller. And it has this cool feature where you can wind the side of the TV and it makes Mario move across the screen. And I'm just dying about how cute it is. And I know that I'm not big into Lego and a lot of us hardcore Nintendo nerds are suddenly deciding where we can find money to buy this because it's cool mm-hmm. and Brittany was like when the the leaked price was like 260 or something and Brittany was like wait legos cost that much oh lego yeah. sets are very expensive oh i yeah. i know now <laughs> well like the big oh. ones for sure yeah yeah this is over 2,000 pieces bt does it's a lot of, a lot of work a lot of pieces yeah a lot of stuff to step on by accident yeah every i was just thinking yeah. the same thing it's, it's true, a lot man. of ouch potential ouch true it is no. going I up. How long something like this would cost to put together? What? 
like how long something like this would cost to build you know oh, what do you mean average, like if like, you task rabbit it or what <laughs> like or do you mean no, like how I, many I, hours it would take yeah how okay. long like I, i'm just i don't know i don't think i don't think any of us probably know the answer to that question like what what is an average lego build like i'm not an experienced spend? enough lego connoisseur to know the answer to this posing a question maybe someone in chat will know not we're not streaming on youtube <laughs> <laughs> no i we'll mean know. i think what you're trying to ask is like how many how long will it take you to build yeah. it yeah. yeah, I think like it depends on your familiarity with the Lego systems. I, I would imagine people who are experienced Lego set builders probably have a little bit more, you know, uh, experience knowing like how to sort pieces, how to put stuff together, because generally like there's like a couple like core pieces in Lego systems and then they build custom pieces for specific sets. But yeah, I considering that I've never built a Lego set like this, it probably is going to take me quite a long time. Maybe I get it and then I stream it. So this oh person God. on Reddit yeah. says, I build a lot of sets. My current average build is 441 parts per hour or wow. seven parts per minute. That's wild. Mm. So they'd be able to build this in about 30 to 45 minutes. <laughs> Jeez Louise. <laughs> but I right. think it's going to well, take a few beauty. hours at least for the inexperienced, for possibly half a day. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Exactly. Fascinating. Right. Um, continuing on, Brittany, you threw this one in the show notes. I did. So, now, is anyone here a fan of D Dragon's Dogma? Mm. Anyone played it? No, but I've heard one the hashtagist talk about it right. constantly. Okay. I figure none of us could really speak about this, so I reached out to him. So Netflix is giving a Dragon's Dogma anime series on September 7th. Dragon's Dogma will follow a man's journey seeking revenge on a dragon who stole his heart. On his way, the man is brought back to life and is arisen. An action adventure about a man challenged by demons who represent the seven deadly sins of humans. This is a very confusing description. I'm, yeah. I'm just going to say. So, seeking re oh, yeah. So Dragon Soul is oh, heart. He's trying to find revenge. He's brought back as an arisen. Okay. Because I did play like 10 hours. Like, how are you going Sasha. after him if you are, like, you're dead? Someone <laughs> takes your art. He's you just, an arisen. Mm. You don't need a heart if you're an arisen. And then you're obviously. like a zombie. Don't they don't they teach you that in school? Anywho. So while the hashtagist who works for Evolve PR is always talking about Dragon Sogma, every event that ever happens, he's always like trying to get Dragon Sogma to trending or trying to will it into existence. So I reached out to him and I was like, what does this mean? Because it is my kind of jam. It's a medieval dragons, oh, swords and trolls and orcs kind of game. So I could be interested in watching this. But he says this. Hey, Brit. I can't do his accent. That was terrible. Some thoughts <laughs> from the number one Dragon's Dogma fan. Obviously very excited that people are going to be exposed to the best game ever. All caps. From what I have seen in the screenshots, they will be telling a new Dragon's, Dragon's Dogma story in a familiar world. The armor worn by the girl bearing the pawn's mark is the same as Mercedes, best girl in DD. Fight me. So at least there are either fun references to the game or they will be expanding on the lore by actually showing Hearthstone, a country neighboring the land DD's place takes in. Dee's takes place in. I also recognize some typical grand soaring architecture, so I really hope we'll visit that place as well. Of course, Dragon's Dogma is about history repeating itself, so who knows when this takes place? Either way, it will be a masterwork. Can't go wrong. That's a very optimistic point of view. Could possibly go wrong. Very, very optimistic. <laughs> I love that kid so much. Such a good, nice guy. <laughs> he is so, a yeah, good guy. I, I mean, Castlevania was really, really successful. Yep. So maybe this will be too. This looks more of my jam. I think I'm going to give this one a watch. I'll watch this and Andrea can watch the Mortal Kombat one. Yeah. And then maybe <laughs> Mr. Yasman can stop asking me if I've watched the Mortal Kombat animated series. I, that's right. I'm calling you out, Yasman. I'm doing Ooh. it. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> continuing on, uh, Skull and Bones update, question mark. So this can't, comes from a very questionable site so this is very much like a <laughs> let's talk about a rumor everybody um according <laughs> to development sources writes video game chronicle <laughs> speaking under the condition of anonymity anonymity did, anonymity. I, did I say that right skull uh, and bones has um, been struggling um, to carve itself a unique position among ubisoft's existing portfolio of open world games last year the decision was made to reboot the game entirely and move away from the premium box model of ubisoft's other open world games skull and bones instead has moved towards a live game model the game will now feature a persistent game world with quests characters storylines that will drastically evolve and change over time based on the collective actions of the community so more more uh, sea of thieves yeah, that's what yeah. I first thought it was, was too. Same. Yeah. Yeah. See if these so getting some competition. I Jeez. agree. This is a rumor. These are also the friends, though, who correctly predicted the Resident Evil 8 news. So they have a well, little like notch 
a they have a much. little bit of credibility is what you're saying a little bit of credibility little, i mean this makes sense in the to cap. Me. we haven't seen shit from this game in a very very long time and you know maybe it's a more realistic sea of thieves with actual private servers that will be coming i mean i'd be down for that i i'm into pirates black flag was amazing i'd like to see more of that ship battle stuff is anyone like, no one really cares about this game either way? So I don't eh. I do not super care about it, but I did care like four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, same. Was it that long ago? No, I think it was I was like, I feel like that's an exaggeration. <laughs> Let's see. Skull and bones <laughs> announced. announced. <laughs> I mean, it was exciting when we first heard about it, and that was around the same time. 2017. Yep, that's that was it. Yeah. It was <laughs> four E3s ago. See, well, for me, though, I, was, I mean, like, this is never going to be a thing that I get super excited about. Even when it was announced, I was like, cool. <laughs> if it comes out, I'll play it. So. Okay. I like the name. That's what I got that's for name. you. <laughs> that's all. That's the, that's the enthusiasm I can muster. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's good enough. And then finally, I added this one in here because I thought it was kind of silly. People are dressing as clowns in Red Dead Online as a form of protest. That's it. That's a story. form of protest for what? So, protesting. yeah, they're protesting the idea that Rockstar hasn't really updated the game in a very... It's been over a year since there's been any meaningful updates Got in the it. game. So, here's um, some stories from Polygon. It says, all is not well in the digital Wild West. Red Dead Online fans know that it's been nearly a year since Rockstar has meaningfully updated the open world MMO. So there's a Discord group with thousands of members who are scheduling a July 20th protest where they're all going to dress as clowns. And then this is the quote by one of the organizers of the protest. <clears throat> Rather than let it turn negative or nasty, which in the game communities things often can, I thought I'd turn our protest into something a bit more fun or even wholesome in a way. We're the clowns for expecting an update or communication from Rockstar, so let's have fun with that. <laughs> wow! <laughs> oh, that's actually kind of yeah. cute. <laughs> that's actually really cute. <laughs> it's too real. It's too real. Wow. Yeah, no, I was looking at PCGamer.com and the, the, apparently on that subreddit where the clown fashion thing took off there's a post that says since we're all clowns for believing we'll get an update it's fitting that we dress up as them in game too yikes yeah. yikes 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 <laughs> but also when nerds are mad they can organize <laughs> but they you know, but they're organizing to do nothing impactful in the game <laughs> whatsoever yeah in true nerd fashion yes yeah. <laughs> oh it's kind of wholesome it's like oh that's cute like, it's a little It'll cute. be absolutely they should call horrifying. K-pop stands. Yes. Oh, K-pop the K-pop stands, stands oh. get shit done. Well, Rockstar would have an update out in a week. Re, I, I love that you br bring them up, but I feel like the K-pop stands are doing much bigger, more important work right now. <laughs> <laughs> Very they have their hands full right now. Yeah, that's the true. full roster of things they're fighting for. <laughs> Those poor K-pop stands just cannot catch a break. They're like, listen. We're going <laughs> overtime. <laughs> Like, I'm trying to memorize all of the BTS choreography and do all this other social work. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Um, and that is going to do it for the new segment for this week. When we come back, it's finally here. The hands-on impressions of Ghost of Tsushima. Stick with us. We'll be right back. What's good, everybody? Welcome back. It's segment two of the What's Good Games podcast. And this is where we're talking about what we've been playing. And this week, it's all about the Samurais. But before we get to that, I want to tell you that this segment is brought to you by HelloFresh. So it was very exciting. Steimer helped me make my HelloFresh box this week. And if you're wondering, what the heck is HelloFresh? Well, you can get fresh pre-measured ingredients and mouth-watering seasonal recipes delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. HelloFresh lets you skip those trips to the grocery store and make home cooking fun, easy, and affordable. And guess what? To get HelloFresh, you don't even have to put your mask on. Win-win. HelloFresh offers contactless delivery to your doorstep for easy home cooking with the family. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in just about 30 minutes or even 20 minutes with their quick recipe options. 
you can save up to 28% by using HelloFresh versus your grocery store shopping trips. And you can easily change your delivery days or food preferences and skip a week whenever you need to. HelloFresh can help you eat more sustainably as well with pre-portioned ingredients, less prep for you and less food waste. Plus, speaking of waste, their packaging is almost entirely made from recyclable or already recycled content. HelloFresh's carbon footprint is 25% lower than store-bought grocery-made meals. And it keeps getting better because they keep your fridge stocked by adding extra proteins or sides like garlic bread with your weekly order. Oh, mm. yeah. Who doesn't love a good side of garlic bread? Mmm. Mm. But the best part, everybody, is that HelloFresh is committed to giving back. They have donated over 2.5 million meals to charity in 2019, and this year they're stepping it up with their food donations amid the coronavirus crisis. Plus, did I mention the food is super tasty? Mm. So Steimer is here, and we decided to make one of the boxes before the recording tonight. And we had the creamy dill chicken with roasted dilly potatoes and green beans. And Ooh. boy, oh boy, I could put that garlic cream sauce on just about anything. It was very good. I you was had, very you had the cream sauce too, right? Yeah, I've had that meal a few times. So Jason and I have been doing HelloFresh for, I would say, at least a year, a year and a half now. And it's a fun thing that we do together. We'll split up the meat, we'll, the prep, we'll you know, take certain things, we'll do all the cutting, I'll do all the meat stuff. And it's just been a fun way for us to just get away from screens and actually just hang out and cook and talk while we're making the meals and yeah HelloFresh has the best meals they really do that one's really good today we had a garlic lemon chicken with mashed potatoes and carrots we made that for lunch yeah it's really good and it's really really easy to get into I've never been one for cooking and but HelloFresh does make it incredibly easy and even two dorks like he and I can bumble around and make it happen and make really good meals so would recommend looking into it for sure yeah, it was fun. Steimer cut all the potatoes, and I pulled all the herbs, and then I baked the chicken. It was it was nice, yeah. and the food and the food Aww. was absolutely delicious. So if you guys want to try some of those delicious dilly potatoes for yourself, you've got to go to HelloFresh.com slash What's Good sixty and use the code What's Good sixty to get sixty dollars off your first three weeks, including free shipping on your first box. That's HelloFresh.com slash What's Good 60 for $60 off your first three weeks with that code What's Good 60 plus free shipping on your first box. Additional restrictions may apply. Please visit HelloFresh.com for more details. <laughs> that was my best super fast advertising voice. You did great. really good. You, yeah, good. you nailed it. Thanks. Yeah. Nailed okay. it like a hammer. Ladies. Yes. <sighs> All of y'all have been playing Ghost of Tsushima. Mm. Yes. Thank you to Sony Interactive Entertainment for providing promotional free copies of Ghost of Tsushima from Sucker Punch for our review. I think that's okay. our, our cue to take yeah. it away. <laughs> that is our cue to take it away. So yes, Ghost of Tsushima is Sucker Punch's latest game. You may know them from Infamous, which came out in 2009, Infamous 2, and Infamous Second Son in 2014. And, and Infamous have... First Light, which is the shirt I'm wearing. I Yay! saw it. Sucker it's Punch so represent. And I was like, so, are you wearing that just because Laura's face is on it? And she's like, no, <laughs> but maybe. No. Maybe. I mean, it's, yeah. it's Sucker Punch Representation Day. That's I think fun. all of us have Wait, move the can so the so folks can see. Yeah, see, look at, look at that pink oh, hair. Pink hair. Nice. Yes. So cute. So, so cute. But yeah, I think going into this, a lot of us were Sucker Punch fans, so we were eagerly anticipating to see what this vast, you know, straight off the beaten path game of theirs was going to be. This is unlike something I think they've ever made before. It's unlike something I'd ever played. So this game follows the Mongol invasion of 1274 into Japan. Obviously, there's a lot of fictional little twists and turns with this, because if you've read the history on this game, or on the actual event, you know, things worked out kind of differently. But that's okay. This is a work <laughs> of fiction. This is a video game. So it follows Jin Sakai, who is a member of the Sakai clan. And he is one of the last remaining samurai. And he is trying to liberate Tsushima from the Mongol invasion. There's your premise. Ooh, yes. Love it. So I so have finished I have the a... game. Oh, oh go I ahead. Throw that out there. I finished the game. I believe Steimer is in Act 2. And yes. Rhi, you're about 10 hours in? Yes, I'm about 10 hours in. Okay. And I have a, a, a question to kick us off, which okay. I'm really, really anxious to hear your answers on. 
So when you first boot up this game, it has amazing loading screens. The visuals and the graphics in the game are absolutely incredible. But what I want to know, what game mode did you all play in? Oh, like Kurosawa started? mode or the normal mode? Did you do mode? Kurosawa mode? Did you do English with Japanese or Japanese with English subtitles? Did you do English, English with English subtitles? Like what game mode did you choose? I started with non-Kurosawa mode with Japanese audio and English subtitles. And an interesting note on that is that if you do plan on playing in Japanese, the English lip mocap or the mocap for the mouth is all in the English um, audio. So you might notice if you're playing in Japanese that the mouth really isn't matching up with what they're saying, but that's okay. It's not a huge distraction because there's a good chance you're reading the subtitles anyway. But yeah, so yeah, Japanese audio, English subtitles and colored mode to start with <laughs> yeah I did the same because I I just actually I was like no it feels weird to me to have English voice acting on this yeah uh, yeah and also sorry not to like hur, 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 but I looked into this uh, a lot of the voice actors are of Japanese descent so that is a good thing to note so it's not like you have a whole bunch of people in the studio not knowing what they're supposed to be doing so I thought that was a good little tidbit that's Excellent. awesome yeah and like one of the things that's definitely stood out to me in this game aside from just it being absolutely beautiful is the photo mode oh. and how easy it is it's press right on the d-pad by default and you can take pictures you can edit them you like like it it it's almost like a love letter to the visuals of video games and it's something that i appreciate in other games but this game really leaned into it in a way that like, i found super super satisfying especially for right now when i'm there's lots of reasons why I love this game for right now, but I'm super stressed out and I just want to look at pretty pictures and <laughs> it makes it super accessible for you to really explore and almost paint your own pictures within the game. And that's something that I really loved. And I don't know if either of you have really played around the photo mode, but have you found it to be the same or different or, or what are some of the things that really stood out to you like right off the bat without getting into spoilers? Oh yes. Before uh, you guys answer that yeah. Um, on the break, there was a discussion about spoilers. This will be a spoiler-free correct discussion yes. of Ghost of Tsushima because the game obviously just came out today. Yes. We're not out to ruin anybody's time. Right. No, oh, no. not at all. Okay. Oh. All right. Continue, please. Oh, continue. Summer, <laughs> did you use the photo mode? I try. I mess around with it very minorly. The only, I'm, I always run into it when I accidentally hit the, <laughs> the yeah. wrong thing in the D-pad <laughs> is when it normally comes up for me. Um, but in general... I did mess around with it a little bit just to see how easy it was. And I agree that it is, it is fairly easy and intuitive to go through. However, that's just not necessarily something that I tend to spend a lot of time with in games. I've got friends who really like Scott, um, who also works at Naughty Dog, Scott Lowe, a friend of mine, uh, posted some really beautiful shots that he took. Uh, and so I can really appreciate what people can do with the tool. I'm just not somebody who's going to be really investing that time into it. Yeah, for me, I've never also been someone who uses photo mode. It's just, it's a cool thing. And I appreciate some of the screenshots that people come up with, like Simon was saying, but it's not something that I want to spend a lot of time doing. However, in this game, I will just find myself going from point A to point B, doing nothing particularly of importance, but then you get that beautiful shot that just kind of manifests naturally. Maybe it's the bright red flowers and the waterfall in the back with the purple skies of the sunset. And you're like, oh, God, dear, that's, that's really pretty. And you can always just kind of angle the camera when you're just playing anyway to kind of get that shot. And I even messed around with the, um, oh, the video mode. Did you test with that at all, Ree? No, I haven't oh. played with video mode yet. Yeah, so you can kind of just create like the short little flick where maybe you'll start zooming in on someone's face and then you'll zoom out to like something else. I only played with it for a little bit, but this is really, I think, like the gold standard of what photo mode should be in a game. The options they have are just incredible. And this game is just absolutely, absolutely stunning. And I so much so that I didn't mind exploring the huge map. <laughs> and then try to 100% everything because I just wanted to see, because everything, there's 40 different biomes in this game. And you, well, the, there's an interesting blog post on PlayStation blog um, by the lead environment artist, Joanna Wang. And she talks about how they created this world and it's an, they have a tool set that they created and whatnot, but it still feels like everything is just manually placed. And you can tell like everything has been looked over because it just, it never seems super duper repetitive. It's just, everything has its personality in a place. And for that reason, I love just exploring and finding. Because you never knew what you were going to find. You know, maybe you're going to find a secret waterfall. Or maybe you're going to find, like, a hot spring over here. Or maybe you're going to find, I don't know, a really cool little hidden beach or alcove. It's just, boh. 
what I find so interesting about the game and its environments is that I, I did have a lot of similar feelings of like, wow, you just you would run across such beautiful things. The lighting would really strike, you know, hit the water in such a way that it was really impressive or the flower fields would just make you feel like you're in a movie and it would have these really cool, beautiful moments. And then it would just <laughs> smack you upside the head with something horrifying. So I was running around and I was like, oh, so beautiful. This game is so beautiful. And then you come across this area that has just been burned to the ground and there's just <laughs> bodies on spikes. And I was like, yeah, well, oh, right. <laughs> this is, yeah. Like, it's just interesting the way that they bring you back to the reality of what they're yes. trying, of the story of the Mongol invasion. So it has a lot of, um, uh, you know, a little ebb and flow there. there. There's a lot of beauty in this world. There's a lot of unbeautiful things a lot of horror horrific things that you will also run into in this world uh, but i didn't find it for the subject matter considering it is it is dark right like it's not mm -hmm. it's never a fun time um getting invaded by another <laughs> land uh it still felt fairly light and maybe that is because i just came off of something incredibly heavy like the last of us but um. i and I don't know if this is a positive or a negative, but I was like, I don't know if I feel as much emotional weight here mm -hmm. as I did no, for I, Tilu. I, I felt that I felt that too, Steimer. And it's funny going back to that. My mom was over and I was show, I was like, hey, look how cool this beautiful this game is because she doesn't know what the hell. And I'm showing <laughs> her this beautiful field. And then there's just charred corpse just in the yes. middle of all of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're like, um, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. Don't it's mind that. It's all fine. Don't, don't mind that. Um, yeah, as far as you know, like the story and the weightiness of it goes, I think I'm with you getting, getting into ghosts was a little hard at first because I think what Naughty Dogs does in terms of storytelling is just so there's just no one like them and hopping into this and trying to feel a sense of empathy with these characters, which you can do, but it doesn't have that emotional impact. Right. Um, obviously spoiler free, but as the story continues on, it shit does get a little darker, but it never really, I agree. Never had that m emotional impact of like, Oh fuck. Like I never at any point felt the need to like sit my controller down and kind of walk away. If anything, it kind of got like the adrenaline pumping. Well, I think, I think yeah. they, they have the benefit of it being that open world. So like, if it does ever feel like a little too much, you're like, I'll go find a Fox then. Cause the Fox is super cute and he's oh, like and chirping and like you, you can, can pet, pet him. Out of 10. Right. Or you can go to the hot springs, like you said, and you're just like, you see Jin's butt and you're like, well, that's not bad. And then oh, he has a nice juicy, juicy booty. <laughs> and then, you know, nothing seems quite as bad when you have a nice butt in your face. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's quotable for the ages. Nothing that's seems perfect. that bad when you've got a nice butt in your face. <laughs> So, Reed, how did saying. you feel about, so far anyway, I know you're only 10 hours in or so, but how do you feel about the emotional impact in the narrative? Yeah, it, it's interesting bringing up the comparison to Tilu 2 because I, of course, felt a little differently about the, my experience playing that game. It was very heavy for me and just things that are going on in the world and in my personal life, it was too much. And this game, I think somebody else said it on Twitter, maybe Blessing at AOE from Kind of Funny, like this is the exact game that I needed to play right now. Because, yes, it does have that heaviness and you do find corpses charred hanging from the trees depending on where you're running around and, and where the Mongols are invading in your map. But there's also moments where you can go to a riverbank and compose a haiku. And even though haiku didn't exist in this time period, it's really fucking great and meditative. And it makes me feel happy and it makes my heart a little bit lighter. And... Those experiences are what I'm looking for in games a lot of the time. Like, I come to games for an escape. I come to games for, you know, something to cheer me up when I'm down or to distract me when there's too much going on. And Ghosts of Tsushima gave me that. And even though there is a very dark story that I'm playing through, it had so many moments and opportunities to just appreciate the beauty of the world and, you know, specifically this world that they have created in this really amazing style and, and just to talk really quickly about the style of the game, like the way they do the titles for each encounter you go into or every new mission that you go into, it's just, it's fucking cool. Like yeah. it just, it feels like you're playing a movie and it, yeah, like The Last of Us did a lot of amazing things and like being very seamless from going to cutscene into when you're playing, whereas Ghost of Tsushima, sometimes it'll fade to black before you go from a cutscene when you're playing again. And a that was- jarring at first, right? <laughs> Yeah, that was a little jarring at first, but but as I got used to it, like this really just became almost a balm on my nerves. And it's the level of beauty matched with the level of challenge and 
and darkness that I was really looking for. And I do appreciate this formula of game where you're running around, you're doing optional missions, you're doing some RPG leveling, you're clearing out areas of occupation in your map, and then you go back to the main story if you want, or you can go hang out with a bunch of people, or you could stare at Jin's butt if you mm-hmm. want to just keep mm-hmm. going and resting at the hot springs. Yeah. And and that amount of freedom I found to be exactly what I was looking for in a game right now. And I'm, I'm absolutely in love with it. So a common criticism, and I'm excited to hear what the two of you think about this game, is that there's too much to do and there's too much bloat. So you mentioned the haiku. There are also vanity gear, hot springs, bamboo strikes, fox dens, pillars of honor, other shrines, duels, and lighthouses, et cetera, et cetera, to find. There's banners, in this game. there's records. Banners, artifacts, records, like a lot, hundreds and hundreds of collectibles oh. and things to find. I personally didn't mind finding it. It's kind of like, usually I don't enjoy that in a game. But her, I think about Horizon Zero Dawn, and that is a game where I found everything because I enjoyed being in that world so much. And I had that same reaction with Ghost of Tsushima, where I just loved being in that world and just kind of experiencing the beauty of it, that I had no problem going from point A to point B just to uncover Fog of War. How did you two feel about it? Brie, go ahead. Yeah, I've, I felt similarly. I loved Horizon Zero Dawn, and I don't mind a lot of bloating games, especially if it's, as you said, Britt, a world I want to be in. And in this world, because it is so colorful and so light and so unique, and you can switch into Corsair mode, and you can take cool pictures and apparently make like little mini films if you want to, mm-hmm. like there, there's just so much to appreciate visually that I don't mind seeing it for hours and hours and hours. Like as I was trying to get through work today, the whole time I was like, I really wish I could be playing Ghost of Tsushima right yeah. now, just because it's a place I want to be. It, it's happy. It's Steimer it's intense, said that the last but... time she was yeah. over here for our shoot for the Patreon, she was like, I just want to go home and play ghosts i think just because it is it is what you know what we was talking about it's a little bit more relaxing in the sense that you can take it at your own pace i'm actually Mm -hmm. very glad that Brittany, you were the main quote-unquote reviewer for this whoa as you take a giant swig of also uh centauri whiskey fantastic japanese whiskey would recommend good lord they did not sponsor what's good game centauri Um, highballs are very popular in tokyo yes Mm -hmm. uh Got it. I have to find my. You were happy that I was the one reviewing. Oh, because because I do not like feeling rushed through something like this. I don't like feeling like I really need to go through because I do. I don't necessarily want a hundred percent everything, but I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And so I don't necessarily always feel like running and doing a main story mission at a night. Sometimes I might want to clear out some farms, or I might want to do one of the side missions for your 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 basically your main side characters will have like Mm -hmm. multiple missions you can go through their stories which i really liked um and like maybe i want to do some of those and clear those out so for me for you to be able to take this like at your own pace is such a benefit and such a luxury in this time and i feel like that was one of the things i always disliked about being a reviewer at a place like ign was you were just like on a time crunch and it made me dislike the game Instead of like, and it wasn't even necessarily the game's fault because I don't think you're supposed to play it that way. No, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's not, and that is intended. Um, so that's that's that. Andrew is doing some stuff, and it's it's messing with, it's distracting me a little bit. I, I realized, I realized while we're talking that I would like to pull up some B-roll. So I'm just going to oh, pull up some B-roll okay. and, try yeah. to get, and try to get that going. But, uh, Got it. Can, so, Simmer, do you feel you like talking. there's too much stuff in the game? Too I much stuff to find or do? I feel like there's definitely a lot. I would say I agree with the criticism that this does not do anything different or special with the open world. I think mm-hmm. it is a good open world. I'm not saying it's a bad one, but it's not out here like making moves or doing anything drastically different. It is an open world checklist, just like many yep. open world games. Um, take that as you will. If you really like that, it's great. It doesn't really matter. But if you are somebody who's really itching and hoping for renovations or like upgrades into a system, I don't think this game has that. Um, so for me, I do think it can get a little overwhelming at times. Uh, I also, uh, have definitely had to go through and upgrade. So the different types of armor will do different types of things, which we haven't really gotten into, but there is one particular set called travel armor and basically Mm -hmm. if you upgrade it it will help expand your fog of war i've been dumping a lot of my upgrades into that because i do not want to feel like i need to run around to every nook and cranny i just want a wider net of things to be uncovered on the map as i run through it um and i definitely don't think i'm going to be 100 in this game but i'll be doing a decent portion of it um so 
okay, she's shaking her fist. Bad <laughs> things are happening. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely kept the. Good. I definitely kept that traveler's armor on so far, pretty much the entire time I played through. And I've only changed when I'm going to clear out camps. Yeah. And, and into samurai armor. Oh, that's funny. Cause I, I didn't know. Cause there's 59 vanity items in this game. So like Samurai was saying, if you put on the body armor, that's the only armor that's really going to impact your stats. Maybe it'll make you more stealthy. Maybe it'll give your health a boost, your attack a boost, your archery a boost, whatever. But you can put on different bandanas. You can put on face stuff. And that's just purely cosmetic, different sword kits, different um, skins for your bow, which is really cool stuff. But I did the same thing, Ray, where I always wear my traveler's armor because you can upgrade it to uncover 30% more fog of war. And I had the same idea Steimer had. It's like, I don't want to have to go <laughs> back and do all of this over again. And what is nice is when you do you liberate a Mongol um, hold, whether it's like a camp or whatnot farm, it will yeah. clear out yeah it will clear out a nice little chunk of fog of war so that would be i guess a good tip to give is wear your travels armor when you're exploring and take out the mongol settlements when you can because that will show you where all the different things are they'll show up as question marks on your map but when you do uncover them it'll be like okay this is what you got to do and yeah. by uncovering those you increase your um health your resolve what else is it? You get your, technique points. Your, your legend grows. Your legend and, and grows. You get more upgrades. I know you usually get supplies. Points. So one of the things yeah. that they showed in one of the gameplay demos was this idea of like customizing your armor and having, you know, Jin, is that the samurai's yeah. name? Yeah. yeah. Jin, yeah. Jin kind of be this like unique version of Jin to you. Is that the system that you guys are describing? Did you feel like it felt like it was robust enough that you liked it and you really appreciated all the options they gave you? I feel like I'm running into a little bit where I feel like I'm not getting enough uh, color sets. So really what yeah. it is is that you have – there are different sets of armor. So there's a samurai armor, um, which is, like, really tanky, beefy. There's, like, an archery armor. There's like different types like that. And each of those That's is a, a very distinct visual style. Each of those, all, they all also individually have upgrades. And as they upgrade, they change visually. Um in addition to that, the real vanity aspect is you can basically select those and you'll unlock as you play throughout the game different die sets essentially that will that you pay for with flowers. So yes. as you run around the open world, you're that's also the collecting currency flowers. Yeah, that's, that's flowers. Yeah. Well, you pick for, flowers. for the dies it is. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of there's different a lot of different things you'll be picking up along the way as you're running around the world in general. So in addition to like fox dens or whatever, like you'll also be grabbing bamboo every time you ride by, you would um you'll be grabbing um supplies Linen, steel, grab every supply yeah bag you can kill you animals for some hides you, far cry style there's a lot there is a lot there's a lot there for sure so i can definitely see people getting overwhelmed with it but i do think that overall they roll it out well enough yeah. to the game so you don't feel like you're just being hit with a bunch of stuff at once um but I feel like right now I don't have, an, I want more colors basically. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't have very many. I have like two or three per set and I'm like, mm -hmm. but I want like seven or eight. <laughs> Give me more. I think the most colors I got on a set of armor, was maybe like five or six. And there's a lot of armor. There's a game. lot of armor. There's a yeah. lot of options. You can make your gin look sexy and sexy like milk like I did I put them in all white I was like yeah look mm -hmm. at you milk or you can put them in goofy ass shit and have them run around looking like a clown it's up to <laughs> you all that matters is the shit you got on his body that's the only thing that impacts his stats so I want to talk about the combat because I really enjoyed the combat like, oh yes a lot a lot a lot I will say I did find it a little clumsy and I Steimer and I were talking about this a little bit over text where you have the L2 and the R2 inputs, and I can get into the specifics of that for a second. And I never could quite figure it out, even after like 55 hours with this game. <laughs> so when you have all of your gear, you hold L2, and then in the bottom left corner, you have um, D-pad inputs, and mm -hmm. you can equip your bow. If you've unlocked a longbow, you can use that, or you can go to a throw icon. And then from the throw icon, you can throw different items like wind chimes or firecrackers or other weapons. So that's the L2. And then also, if you hover over, and this sounds confusing because it kind of is, if you hover over, like, the longbow when you have L2 pressed, then you have to select your different arrow types from a little menu on the right using, like, triangle or square or circle, for example. And then if you push R2, it opens up your stances, which there are four different stances that you want to use depending on which kind of enemy you're going after. There's wind, stone, water, and moon. But also when you push R2, it gives you a menu to use your kunai, which are, like, little 
throwing daggers, I guess is how I would explain it. Sticky bombs and smoke bombs, et cetera, et cetera. Those are all the things you, qu it's basically your R2 is anything you quick throw. Like right. it's just it's, an insta yeah. throw with a direction. So did you, do you have it down? Am I just the only one? Who's no, I mean, it took me a while. It's, I still struggle with it. Sometimes I hit the wrong button. I'll end up like accidentally throwing a wind chime at somebody when I'm trying to throw Same. something <laughs> yeah, else. I like, I do, I do think that they maybe went a little too hard with, with all of the gadgets that you have, like, cause you're a samurai, you're not Batman, but it feels like <laughs> you're a little bit of both. You're and, and a samurai. You're not Batman. I just have to say, when you said I threw a wind chime at somebody, all yeah, I can literally. think of is like the thing that you hang on the front yeah. of your porch that like, yeah. is that okay. literally what you're talking about? Yeah. So you, it's basically like an Assassin's Creed or any sort of stealth game where you can hide in like the, in the bushes and you can throw a chime and it, it will make a noise and they'll come investigate. But like you're throwing like the shape of a ball. Oh, the okay. they're much smaller. Not, not okay. They're tiny wind chimes. But when you go to pick them up in the world, it is a wind chime. That is being yeah. like on a porch. Oh, and so you, you're essentially like pulling a piece of the chime off and like yeah. putting it in your and pocket. Then, yeah. Okay. And then you, yeah. You and if he was just carrying all of these. I'm like, just like, like, he's, he's just jingle jangling everywhere. And just like <laughs> I'm throwing stealthy. the whole thing. I'm yeah, I was stealthy. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. I mean, <laughs> that, that's an interesting point because like it's so far in Grand, I'm only 10 hours in, but I haven't focused on stealth approaches at all. Okay. I'm, I'm very much... Um, role playing Jin Sakai as like I am honorable I don't sneak up on people I'm going to face them head on so when I go into an encounter I usually always opt to stand off and the stand off mechanic if you choose not to go in stealth is freaking rad like so what happens is like you choose to go stand off when you're meeting a, a group of enemies and then you have almost like a like quick draw moment where you're you know 10 paces apart and you're holding the triangle button and you try to see if they fake and then, and then they actually strike you. And when they actually strike you, you let go of triangle and then you like insta kill. Oh. And then you can upgrade it so that you can chain them and insta kill another person. And I love the the head to head melee combat. I know stealth is definitely an option, but I am really, really, really digging not going in stealthy at all. So wind chimes are completely out of my repertoire for my playthrough so far. So I'm just wondering how the combat has been different for you two I without mean, going into major spoilers. The Kanai are really clutch, I'm just oh, gonna yeah. say. Yeah. Like, those are super fun. Um, the, uh, the one side note that I want to get into because of what you just mentioned, this is just a pro tip for anybody playing this game. Go do Yuna's mission if you do <laughs> want to assassinate people <laughs> because I did not. So like it's one of the very first missions you'll get um, it, as the story starts to branch out and it'll be like, oh, go with Yuna. Um, go with her. Actually, go do it, please. Because what happened was I just was like, meh you know what? I'm not going to do anything main story. I am going to run around the world. And I ran around the world without the ability to assassinate anybody for quite some time. <laughs> and I was just really confused because I looked on the controller mapping and it said square to assassinate. And so I would crawl, I would like crouch and get up next to somebody and hit square <laughs> and it would just hit them with my sword. And I was like, what? <laughs> I was so confused. I had no idea what was going on. Um, and that to me though is a, that's a UI design flaw. They should never have let you see Square to assassinate before you unlocked it. They should never yeah, have just yeah. like it re was, re revealed that. that it was an oops. That first unit mission should have been like a required mission. It should have been it's, a not, it's not a long yeah. mission at all. So poor yeah. Samer, she was texting me. She's like, "How do I fucking assassinate people?" Yeah, because like, wow. Brittany's like, "I'm stabbing people left and right in the back," and I was like, "Cool. How do I <laughs> how do I do that? Like, I'm not, I can't do it." Um, so I do think they should have incorporated that into just directly taken you as the player into it through one of those very beginning yeah. missions. Um, I think, I think what you have to be careful in an open world game like that, because there are people like me who are just gonna be like, eh, not doing main thing or what, what I consider to be main things because of how they're colored on the map. Um, mm -hmm. to, I mean, for a pathing while, right? is important, yeah. right? Like the way that designers communicate to the player, how they're supposed to proceed, especially in open world games where so much is left to player choice. If you have a very integral mechanic, like an assassinate, you know, combat, you know, skill, you got to communicate to the player that that's an important thing they have to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so, yeah. Yeah. But to go back to your question, Reed, too, I, I found myself enjoying the stealth a lot, actually, like a lot. I was, yeah. you, I was with you at first where I enjoyed face tanking and doing the standoffs. But as I continue playing, obviously, you're going to have some missions that require you to go stealth. And I think some of the encounters you're going to have are going to be more tactfully approached if they're done from a stealthy 
point of view. Um, yeah. So what I love though is putting on my armor that helps me. And I'm not mentioning specifics because I think it's fun to figure what the and find these on your own. But on your armor, that makes enemy detection slower than getting in the grass and then throwing a wind chime and sneaking up and assassinating someone or chain assassinating or throwing the kunai at people or doing whatever you could do. Because ultimately, I would fail. And I know I would fail. And then I would get busted. And then I'd have to break out into the hand-to-hand -hand combat. And that, I, like, during the hand-to-hand -hand combat, I was so pumped while I was doing that <laughs> shit from the pairing with L1 to the dodgy with circle to like all of this stuff like it just felt so snappy to me and it felt like everything I was doing was translating as I wanted it to in the combat which was great um go into the difficulty real quick because I think this is related I started off on easy and then I found that the combat is just like easy easy you can mm -hmm. still like be a badass and do your cool moves, but you're not going to have any problems whatsoever. So I bumped it up to normal, and that's when I found it was the most rewarding because you really do have to think about what you're doing. And there's so many options, especially as you do unlock all of those little different ghost tools that you get. And as you can experiment with the bow and kind of really manipulate the battlefield based on your tools that you have. But um, anyway, yeah, so I got off topic, but I would try... <laughs> Easy if you just want to be able to like go through the story. You're not gonna have a hard time. You can still have fun with the combat, but normal is definitely you have to be a little, a little careful. Cause as Simer texted me and then I found out later, when you die, they kick you a lot, and then you have loading screens. That was yeah. yeah my <laughs> there are very little, like I have minor gripes with the game. Yes, that's one of them. And I again <laughs> I understand the design choice behind it because you can invest technique points into um like basically having a revive time. So they needed to give you time in order to use that if you wanted to, to get back up. But it takes so long for them to kill you sometimes. It and does. sometimes you just want to die and <laughs> you can't. And it's sad. You're you just, just want watching. to die. Sometimes, sometimes you, you do. Just want sometimes to die. you're like, please just end it. And they just sit there and they kick you for like a few sec, like for like 30 seconds. And you're like, can you, can yeah. you please just stab It's pretty me? tough to watch your 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 precious little juicy butt cheeks just like get curb stomped <laughs> for, for 10 seconds straight. It right. is a weird, it's a weird choice though. Like maybe there's some kind of cinematic quality because obviously a lot of this game draws from traditional samurai in Japanese action film, right? Like Sucker Punch has talked yeah. about that pretty openly. Obviously the Kurosawa mode is something we, we'll talk about later, but like this idea that they're drawing from this like more cinematic experience. Do you think that they're trying to like make you feel something or no, do you think it's, it's just like they kind of just bungled it? It's no, it's literally to give you time in order to use the ability if you invest into it. There's so you can, you can, you can revive. I don't like that. Yeah. So, like, like but that. you would need you would need time to hit that button if they insta kills you. You don't like you. it now, Andrea, but you will like it when you fall off a really tall cliff and you don't hit the circle button at the right time and you're like Ugh! on the ground and then you can revive. <laughs> and then you, then you can, you'll yeah. appreciate it. So like they they <laughs> give you space to use the revive that you'll be able to unlock. Um, mm. That's what it's yeah. there for. But when you don't have that because you don't necessarily invest, in, I didn't invest into that right away. Mm -hmm. Then it's just yeah. painful to be like, please <laughs> stop. It. it just feels like a weird. I I just obviously I'm I played literally zero minutes of this game because I, like I said, I want to start streaming it from, from the beginning. And I, when I say I've played zero minutes, I mean, I've played nothing in a press demo. I've played nothing in a preview coverage. I've literally played zero minutes of ghost of Tsushima and just hearing you ladies talk about it. You say something like that to me, it feels like it's punitive for the sake of being punitive. And I just, the, gristles me as a player like I don't like when developers put a mechanic in the game that's designed to be punitive to say oh you should have invested in this skill tree instead of this skill tree lol mm -hmm. we're gonna make you be punished by watching this absurdly long death animation because well if you just invested in the skill tree you could get rid of it I go I, that rubs me wrong am I being overreactive I mean, it, no, it rubbed me fair. the wrong way, too, at first. I think I eventually just got over it. Like, but and yeah. then, I mean, you have to get over it because then you're forced to invest in it, right? Like, I feel like... I actually still haven't, but yeah, I, I just either. die less. <laughs> <laughs> just get yeah. good <laughs> hashtag get good is the answer hashtag, I mean yeah, they, they definitely have some moments that feel like 
they're for me, I found them slightly tedious. I think they were going for a cinematic effect. An example of this is when you go into more boss-like encounters, there'll be a really long standoff with it where it's like, I'm looking at you. You're looking at me. We're going to make eye contact yeah, for like an un that. uncomfortable long time. That's and the then I'm going that's to... That's Japanese that. cinematic Yeah, thing. no, that's, it's yeah. Very, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's a cinematic style choice, which I'm not faulting them for. But for me personally, I was just like, okay, I... Please stop. <laughs> I've seen this before. I've seen this before. Yeah. You're going to pull your sword no, out understand. just slightly. And then eventually we will actually fight. Um, yeah. I, I ate those like, parts oh, up. I absolutely yeah. love that. Episode. Yeah. And like, that's, that, yeah, that's just a personal thing on whether personal or not preference. you, exactly. you like it or not. Um, for me, I'm like, I'm such like a practical nerd. I'm like, no, just get to the, just, just do the thing. I want to just stab the man with the sword. But, no, but I this is the, the honor of the samurai. I know. But I is, have no honor. No, but you do have honor. But like, here's the thing. I, this is important to talk about because I, while I've seen plenty of classic like samurai movies and I absolutely appreciate the cinematic filmmaking of those movies, I don't know if I'm going to appreciate being forced to be patient in these moments because Sucker Punch decided they wanted to make this game in the style of this specific type of filmmaking. And like they're inserting that into the gameplay choices to say, we want the player to experience this because this is the love letter to Japanese filmmaking. And I think that some players are going to, as Ree said, eat it up and be like, I can't get enough of this. I've been waiting for this. It's so gorgeous. This is exactly what I wanted. But there's op absolutely going to be players on the other side who s would say maybe like me like th when I play games I'm not looking for this experience I'm not sitting mm -hmm. down to engross myself in a cinematic experience like I do with a movie where I can kick back and not hold a controller not have to be active I can be more of a a passive viewer of the art whereas in video games you have to be an active consumer and an active participant right like i feel like it's a very different medium and i think that's what's really interesting about what sucker punch is doing and i'm concerned that they're they may alienate some other potential fans of this game because they've maybe leaned a little too far into that cinematic aspect i think it's not as frequent as yeah, yeah as like that's what i was gonna say we're it's not yeah yeah we're talking about it i'm bringing them up because they were minor points but I think when you look at it holistically and you look at it from like the entire game, it's not going to be enough. It's not so frequent that you're going to be like, Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. um, but it is a thing that happens where sometimes you are just like, Ooh, that's a little irritating, but it's okay. I get what I like. I get what you're doing, but I am not always patient. Nelly. Sometimes I'm impatient Nelly. And I, yeah, I think want to get going. Last like what? 15 seconds where you're yeah. staring at one another. And then it like, dramatically shows Jin like opening his or, or um, she 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 being, yeah yes um, his yeah. katana oh and well, well she like, thing is oh, putting back it I don't actually know. I think that like that's not what I'm talking about Brett because I think if you're doing like a like a like a, a mini boss or boss encounter I'm, I'm talking more about that's like what we're talking about I'm talking more about like the moments the cinematic moments that are emphasized throughout the game not just that one like the idea of like oh we're gonna kick you until you're dead unless you upgrade or we're going to make you do this th other thing or this other mechanic and yeah. how like they're really weaving that throughout a lot of the gameplay. They definitely do. And, and what we mentioned earlier, um, the way that they do each mission, it is very cinematic and it very like each one starts and it tells you the tale and it's like the tale of whatever. Um, and it's always this really beautifully shot piece. It's like fucking gorgeous. It's just like, DP really knows his rule of thirds. Like it just like they're nailing all those shots. But it the is, rule it, of thirds is important to everybody. It is, and they know how to use yeah. it. Thank God. They so they have all these really beautiful shots there. Um, and then usually when you go into something like if you clear out an area, um, what I think is really cute, but also I would uh, my minor irritation on this is so fucking superficial. But sometimes you'll like you'll go back like if you clear out a farm the game will load you back into the farm when it's like repopulated with um, local people versus the Mongolian invaders. And you as Jin will be there with your horse. And mm -hmm. sometimes you're adorable and napping, but you know what? You can't take a screenshot there. That irritated me. I was like, oh, I want to get a picture a of this. Screenshot. You can't take a nap screenshot. Oh. And I was like, I want to take a, a picture of me napping. You with can't even horse. take like a system screenshot? You screenshot? might be able to take a system screenshot, but I wanted to do photo mode there. And you can't do yeah. photo mode. I think because, I mean, those That's are, lame. in my opinion, I think those are just hiding loading. I think those are 
loading screen. Oh, okay. Um, so, so I think yeah. that's you, why it is. If you hit is. the share button on the DualShock, I, you could probably. I think I probably could do it that way, but I was like really wanting to mess around in photo mode with it. But I think you can't because I think it's actually just a loading screen. But it's yeah. really cute. It's Aww. fucking adorable. It is really cute. Those are really cute moments. They are. Somebody. So if as we're talking about. Oh, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, Ree. I was going to say, if we're talking about minor grievances, I do have a few. But one that I really want to mention is that there are a lot of upgrades. There are different stances you can do. There are different uh, ghost weapons you can pull out, as we said, map to the L and R buttons, and it gets a little bit complicated sometimes. But they all use the same upgrade um, currency, I guess, technique yeah, points. Yeah, technique points. And that was not very clear when I started. So I dumped all of my technique points in finding all the, the fox dens and the hot springs. Cause oh, you did it all on Guiding Winds? Fox. Yeah. I did it all in Guiding Winds because I wanted to pet the fox. I wanted to see the butt cheeks. And I was like, let me just find all of the side stuff. I mean, the butt cheeks. Easily. I don't, we don't blame you. Yeah. 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 But unfortunately, I, I started dumping skill points in that into those Guiding Wind mechanics. And before I realized it, I was not <laughs> upgrading my combat skills because they all use the same, the same technique points. And that was really disappointing because it was not made very clear to me. And that was a point of frustration that I had pretty early on. Where I was like, at three or four skill points later, I was like, oh shit, like I can't upgrade any of my combat mechanics yet because I've been finding all these foxes and petting all these foxes. Oh, that's but, interesting. Yeah, so yeah, very minor. Once you, um, what Ray's talking about. So you do have the four stances again: the Stone, Wind, Water, Moon, and each one of those stances has four upgrades under that. You have the Samurai abilities, Deflection, and Evasion, and both of those have five different trees. And then you have the five ghost weapons, which can be all upgraded, I think like two each. And then you have the evolving tactics. It So there is a lot to upgrade. Uh, I didn't have that issue, but I can see, you know, especially if you're starting early on and not everything has unlocked yet. Because like Steimer was saying, unless you do that first mission first, you're playing well, the beginning of the game without your, you know, ghost techniques. And then you're like, well, I have all these points. What should I put them in? Uh, I... For what it's worth, when I finished the game, I had long since unlocked everything. So I feel like they're pretty generous with uh, ex experience points and unlocking skill points as you play. Missions will give you them. If you usually defeat a few Mongols alongside the road, you'll get a skill point. So I feel like there's not really an issue where you're not going to be able to fully upgrade your character by the time or when you need to. It's just a little bit of like yeah. going around and exploring. But that's an interesting point, though. Yeah. It's just, yeah. It's just a disappointment because I really, really, really love the combat. And I wish I could be building it out more, but I'm almost working like at a deficit because I like max out my guiding winds though, immediately. Girl, all the foxes. <laughs> yes, all, all the foxes, foxes and all the butts. I but think I think foxes. Something we haven't also talked about, which probably is worth mentioning, are all the charms that you get in this game. So yes. you have you have the body armor, which is like again your main stat buff, depending on how you want to play. And then you have charms on your. Katana? Is, are they on your katana? I don't know where I they think hang. The, I think they're just on you. I think you they're just got charms. They're, they're just on a the charming dude. Weapon. Yeah. Um, and you unlock these. You unlock the charm slots by doing the fox sends and the in uh, appeasing the Inari shrines, right? And it unlocks them. And these are are charms that you can easily change whenever you want. You just open the menu, even if you're in the middle of a fight. You can just be like, okay, I need this, and then you can go ahead and do that. And it'll, you know, slow down detection speed. It'll make it so you throw extra kanai. It'll make it so you know your health is increased by a moderate amount. And it's another way to fully customize your character. Uh, I found though that it's interesting. You get several of the same charms. Yeah, I'm getting duplicates. Already. And I guess it makes sense if you want to stack. But there just seemed to be a lot. Because at the most, I think you can have six charms open. You can have two or six charms at a time. You have two, like, major charms, which have the really cute um, customized charms in the art, which I think look really good. But then the remaining four are just kind of like your generic, like, little minor buffs. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you have, did you guys find yourself playing around with those at all? Or oh, like, absolutely. Well, yeah. I've been switching oh, okay. them out a fair amount because I just am like, oh, maybe I want to, oh, I got this new one. I'll try that out or whatever. This, mm -hmm. or this one suits my play style a little bit better. Um, yeah. I thought that those were just a nice addition. It's not something I think about a lot when I'm playing, but it, yeah. they are something that I make sure that they're, I'm keeping up with them. But the one thing that yeah. Rhea had mentioned as if we had talked about it before and I realized we haven't is actually the guiding wind mechanic, which is oh, a very yeah. big part of the open world and how you navigate yes. it. Um, if you've seen any of the Sucker Punch uh, releases, Trailers. I don't know what they called them, but they were like, you know, the pre the previews of 
from the play. studio. See to play. That's what it's called. I was like, what is that thing called? Um, <laughs> so when you are running around on your horse, which by the way, you get to name and you get yes. to pick the color of. And Wait, so what, what were all your horse names? Mine was Shadow. I had Nobu. I had Sora, which means sky. Aw, Sora. We all had different ones. Kingdom Hearts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you get to sort of build your horse and build build your friend throughout the game. Um, and while you're riding around on your horse, named whatever you pick, uh, you just basically hit swipe up on the, not the D-pad, the... Um, Touchpad. Touchpad. Touch Touch pad. That. There we go. Thank you for words. And... The wind will bas- basically just blow in the direction of either a pin that you've dropped towards a mission, or if you have what Rhi was talking about, you can basically be like, okay, I want a guiding wind to any fox den. And then it will just basically direct you into the nearest one, and you can just continually chain around. So if you didn't want to like feel like you're hunting and with absolutely zero direction, you don't have to. You can invest <laughs> those points in and find things a little bit easier that way, which is really nice. And you don't have to keep looking at your map you can be like i opened the map i dropped my pin i'm going there and then you can just keep directing yourself by hitting the wind prompt i love yeah. the guiding wind it's so beautiful and it's such a way to declutter the screen it's just like ah yeah. here's this natural little thing a gust of wind telling me which way i need to go i don't know if any other games have done that before but mm. either way i really appreciated it it was really yeah. nice yeah it's really pretty i also really like that your controller has that wind sound in it too mm-hmm. so even oh, if you're it? playing like yeah. yeah if you're playing without headphones you can hear it coming out of your controller oh. and again like it just kind of lends itself to like the amount of peace <laughs> that i felt playing this game and like why i want to keep going back to it cuz it really is like it's like a haven in this crazy fucked up world <laughs> is going back to the world of ghosts and uh, it's just so beautiful that's something that I think PlayStation has exclusively done with their controller compared to the Xbox One controller. They've really allowed developers who want to to utilize these features in the DualShock 4 from the light bar and changing the color of the light bar to reflect what's happening on screen to the audio cues. I think one of the standouts for me is from... The Division 2 where certain pieces of audio logs will play just through the controller, but so many games have utilized it. So I think it's really cool to hear that Sucker Punch, obviously, you know, a first party studio for PlayStation, really utilize their hardware to say we want to do something interesting and unique with this, you know, piece of tech that we have available to us by saying this is a little touch, but those little touches help make it more immersive and really contribute to the experience. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Love it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, other than that, though, I don't have too much more to say. And, and we're not going to talk too much about story. But I just yeah. think it's... So, Rhea, I know it sounds like this is definitely your game of the year so far. It's up yeah. there. It's, it's yeah. like, it's it's here with Ori. Like, it's okay. it's, 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 it's tough. This, this yeah. is the exact game that I want to play right now, which is what's kind of putting it over the edge for me. So, we'll see. We'll see how it shakes out. We'll see what Cyberpunk does. Because that's a, that's a meaty boy. Oh, I will yeah. agree with the sense that or with the sentiment that it is the game I want to play right now. Like I'm really enjoying my time with it. It is bringing me a lot of peace. It's bringing me a lot of the freedom that I want. Or like it's again, despite the subject matter is oddly (laughs) relaxing. um, A lot of the time, obviously not every mission is, but for the most part, if you want to just kind of hang out in Japan, you can. And uh, a lot of, a lot of the environments are really beautiful. So you can kind of take that mental break. Uh, That that being said, I, I don't know that I would be, putting it on my goatee list yet like I do feel like for me I need to see a lot of things that other studios do later this year before I I put it place it anywhere because to me again it did a lot of interesting things but it didn't do anything drastically different um Mm -hmm. and so that for me that's why I kind of would be like well this is a really good game it's very solid and it does a lot of the things that it set out to do I just don't know if it innovated yes no yeah it's a really I... fun, awesome game that is really beautiful, but like they didn't necessarily push the boundaries of anything. At least so far, that's how I feel about it currently. Again, I'm not done with the game, but that's how I'm that's how I'm feeling about it so far. Yeah, I think I'm in the boat of I think it's up there as a contender for sure. I think someone could absolutely make an argument for why this could be their game of the year. Uh, I'm still kind of up there with like Tilu and Final Fantasy 7, but I think what this game did is something really beautiful. And for me personally, it's really rare that a game 
really grabs me to the point where I want to collect everything. The last game that did that was uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. And that was another world again where I just wanted to be in there and I wanted to find everything because I just wanted to see what what was built because you could really sense the effort of everything. And I think the open world and I think that world in general is really where everything has been pushed. And I can't think of another open world I've really enjoyed more that's been as beautiful, that's pushed me to want to do photo mode, that's literally made me <laughs> stop and like try to get that angle just so I can kind of like gaze at it from a different perspective and take photos and like do all that kind of stuff. I think the what's really great about it as someone who's finished it is there is a uh, dialogue in this game but like obviously not a lot it's a lot of short sentences but even with the, the short and what i mean by that is like maybe Elise can help me explain this is it's not like these in-depth monologues that you get from a lot sure, of other no. story driven yeah. games right it's a lot of more like few paragraphs here a few paragraphs there and then like we're done and then we move on mm -hmm. but even with that short amount of time I think the storytelling and the writing is so well done and it really conveys the emotion of these characters and they do such a great job at explaining their backstories and their motivations although like most games it's all all about revenge which I guess makes sense I mean your island was just <laughs> invaded by Mongols I guess okay sure you like you have your reasons like I understand and we didn't talk about the side quests too much but I don't really think we need to but I think the side quest quests are also incredibly well written and these characters like Lady Masako she's a fucking badass and oh my gosh to, dude <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. I, th I think they did a really brilliant job with a lot of the side narratives, um, the side characters, yeah. the people who become part of your group or can become part of your group. I suppose you could also just like not do their missions and leave them behind entirely, but um, it would be a yeah. much different experience if you did. Uh, I recommend going and hanging out with all of them because I do think they all have their individual offerings. I think they're interesting. And I, I, I agree with you, Britt, in that it's really remarkable what they were able to do with character development, considering the fact that, yeah, you aren't you're not sitting there with like with actually for a very long time with most of these characters you have like yeah. few di lines of dialogue in between and a lot of it is either story told through um the world or just through um like these really short missions so and they mm -hmm. were able to do it in my opinion and like so question mm -hmm. as somebody who question. isn't drawn to Japanese culture as a media vehicle or is it necessarily drawn to Japanese cinema, particularly this era of Japanese culture with, you know, the Mongol invasion, will I still be able to attach myself to what's happening in this world knowing that like I'm walking in going, I think it's really a pretty looking game, but I don't have a particular affinity to samurais. Yeah, I think the the character, the side character stories are more human tales, like than anything but else. But they have like, limited mm -hmm. dialogue. You just said. Yeah, but I, I, I only in the sense meaning that like no one is going blathering on for like four minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah I just, with the limited dialogue, they're still able to tell a very conclusive story from start to finish with ups and downs and emotions and feelings, and it's mm -hmm. they're very well told stories. I think that's what. Yeah, I think I think like they are succinct, but that doesn't mean that they are not impactful. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that's the that's the perfect word for it, Simer. Succinct. Like they they communicate all of the emotionality, all of the the impact that you're supposed to have with like their motivations and like why they're doing what they're doing and like where they're going and why you care about it and why you're allying with them or not. And but they do it very quickly and they do it in a way that's like, oh, okay, I understand what you're trying to do. Let's do it. And like they don't waste a lot of time. Feels and very Japanese. Yeah, I feel like this game is very respectful of my time, and it's interesting to say for an open world game because like I can choose to do all of the Foxins or not, and I can choose to like go straight mainline story and you know get to the end or not. Like like it, it lets you choose how much time you waste or appreciate. And time I, you invest, I really not well waste. <laughs> Well, no, but she, I, I'm just kidding. I saw it as waste or appreciate. And I think like the word appreciate could be substituted for invest. Right. Sure. Like, and for somebody who's li literally just trying to get through the game, I think it's like these things are time wasters. And when we, you look at the gamut of reviews, right. Cause this score, the game has scored like a, like a B to B minus. Right. Yeah. So like obviously mm -hmm. a very good game, but not like a super excellent game. And I think the people that have, scored it a little bit lower are looking at it as like you appreciate it I look at it as like you're wasting my time and I think that's sure. what's impactful about what you said Ray and why like 
people like the three of you who clearly invested the time into exploring those other parts of the game because you were interested in the world. You wanted to see more. You loved the beauty of what Sucker Punch has created versus other people who are like, I'm not attached to this world and these other things are just prohibiting me from completing the story. But yeah. I feel like that's every open world that's, game's problem. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And I, I think nothing prohibits you from moving forward. I, mean, I suppose, except your own skill level. Um, in the yeah. sense that you do need to like go get technique points and build into those trees. Baby ass baby mode. But Or, yeah, honestly, I feel like you probably don't even need to do that if you did want to just play it on easy. Because um, yeah, I accidentally, easy. accidentally played on easy for a little while. I started off with medium. I would occasionally tune it down to easy for some of the boss battles when I was just... It was late and I was impatient. And I didn't want to deal with it. <laughs> uh, but then I accidentally left it on after that, uh, one of those, and was running around. I was like, why is this? Why am I like one shotting everybody? I was like, this feels <laughs> weird because this is yeah. not how it normally goes. I was like, maybe I just really upgraded my sword. I don't know. And then I went through on the menu and I saw it was still on easy. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> Put it back up to medium. And then I was like, oh, yes. Okay. This is, this is yeah. what I'm here for. Yeah, Andrew, I'm really excited to hear how you like the game because I know this typically isn't your jam and it's obviously very much my jam. It's just kind of like innately my jam. So it's hard for me to remove that part of myself and be like, would someone enjoy this? Because thinking about it, I don't feel like it's, you know, Japanese history and culture like shoving down your throat this whole game. I'm sure there's, you know, like the fun little historical nods, which I think are really great. And I think it's important for games to explore those and include those more. But um, I think, you know, at, the, at its core, it's just an enjoyable open world game like like Ree said you know you don't have to spend all your time finding all the bamboo strikes and all the shrines and doing all of the things you can just kind of mainline it, especially if you put it down to easy so I'm excited to hear how you like it after yeah, you start I, playing it as I do enjoy obviously like Japanese culture and Japanese things but um I actually have never watched like a samurai movie and I actually haven't watched a lot I watch anime but I haven't watched a lot of actual <laughs> Japanese cinema and I still find a lot of appreciation for this game and in the way that they do storytelling. And it's not about even, I think, the style. I think it's just that I think the stories are ones that I can appreciate. And I think that the characters are people <coughs> I can appreciate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Well, this seems like a very thorough discussion of the game. <laughs> Um, without saying anything about the story at all <laughs> well i think that's important though because like obviously yeah. you know we want the game isn't out yet we want to leave a lot of discovery do you think though that the story is impactful enough to have a spoiler cast for i don't know yet me either i don't should i answer that since i eh, i would say let's we'll <laughs> if, yeah. we, if we feel like it will then we'll we'll do that we'll fire that up later and yeah, you'll know. yeah 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 yeah. But like Rhea and I haven't finished. So. I feel right. though yeah. that the fact that you haven't finished and you don't have an answer is telling that like the story may be <laughs> interesting and engaging, which is great, but it's not so divisive that like it needs to have like a let's talk about it moment. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how controversial it's going to be in terms of like the way it plays out. That's all. That's yeah. I don't know about that. But, uh, I mean, but that doesn't yeah. mean it's not a good story. It's just like there, there definitely is are a few moments that I think would definitely warrant a spoiler cast but i think this is just isn't that kind of story right this isn't a story of character relationships and, and major betrayals and xyz it's about a man trying to liberate his island from yeah. invaders right it's not like the super it's not a big drama even though it's like a cinematic movie so yeah i'll just leave it at that hmm i think that speaks I've, volumes you though. said that you you said that you've watched samurai movies andrea mm -hmm. like what are they like like what, like in terms of story, I, I just, I'm I mean, honestly like, deeply curious. Like no, I've but, never watched that, one. But that's the thing though, is that most samurai movies don't have these deep, complex narratives. They're very much like uh, stereotypical, like plot devices. And the thing mm -hmm. about them is like, they rely far more on their cinematics and far more on these high moments of drama in these mm -hmm. moments of conflict than they do on these, uh, when I say moments of conflict, I mean moments of like actual physical conflict, not like moments of emotional conflict. And I think like it's interesting when you and I, Steimer, were discussing you playing this in the wake of Tilu, right? Like how The Last of Us Part Two was a 
dramatically different type of game for obviously a variety of reasons. But when we talk about narrative, like how that game really leaned super heavy into the narrative being like the pillar for that game where it seems like Ghost of Tsushima is leaning more into the art and the styling of the open world and some of the mechanics of combat as like the pillar for the game versus the narrative being, I don't want to say the word afterthought because I don't want to be reductive because I haven't played the game, so I can't make that assessment, but of it being not the star of the show. I would say it's, a, a, support, fair it's a supporting pillar. I do agree with the assessment yeah. that the open world and the style are more of the forward facing, um, elements that the that naughty dog or god naughty dog that sucker punch wanted to put forward <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah okay. i agree i think this game is it's definitely a hero's journey um it's definitely something that touches on universal truths of like feeling lost feeling like inspiration feeling conflict about like what you're doing and how you're going about accomplishing your goals there, there's a lot of very accessible motivations i would say but for me, the reason why this is my personal goatee, and obviously not, I'm not saying this is the best game that's been put out this year. Sure. It's my favorite because of the way I feel when I play it. And it doesn't make me think about anything that I don't want to think about. <laughs> and that may be a cop out. That may be, no. uh, I don't know, like a, a bitch way to play a game, but it makes me feel good. No. And I do feel challenged. Mm-mm-mm. And it's not we all happy We stuff, don't use but it, those it terms. There's no bitch way to play a game, okay? <laughs> there is a baby-ass baby Fair. mode way to play a game. There, There is a baby-ass baby mode. I'm I'm one, I think it was at moderate or, or like standard. It's medium. For the way I've been it's playing It's easy, so medium, hard. But yeah. yeah. But yeah, more than anything, I'm not thinking too much when I'm playing this game. I'm feeling really good. And that's kind of where Dang. I fall on it. That's actually, yeah, it's a good point. I also find that too. And I just riding through the wilderness, I just found my mind kind of like going, but in a peaceful way, right? It's like, oh, this is gorgeous. You're looking around. You're like, this just feels so peaceful. Maybe I'm thinking about something pleasant. It was almost meditative in that sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I just yeah. laughing because again, like I think that the game is so interesting to me because it has all of that, and then again, you're just like, and then there's a bunch of corpses, charred corpses. and there's yeah. a bunch of charred so corpses. So you're just but like, just, oh, it's so beautiful. Game. <laughs> like it's just yeah. such a weird game to talk about for that reason because it is on one hand very beautiful and at the other hand very disturbing. Maybe they could implement like a patch where it's just like no corpse mode, where yeah. you don't have to like worry about finding five dead bodies on the beach. Happy no, trees like, mode. <laughs> Let's just yeah. go have some happy trees. All mode. foxes <laughs> mode. Yes. I want an all foxes mode. Every charred corpse is converted to a fox. Oh my god, that would be oh the most god. adorable. <laughs> yes. Yes. Cute. Who do I Just have like, to write as sucker punch? Because it's, <laughs> it's interesting because it is. It's like when you're running around the open world, a lot of times you feel like a Disney princess in the way that like you have the foxes running up to you wanting to take you to the mm-hmm. shrine or you have a bird who's like, come this way. And you're like, <laughs> okay, oh, neat. Yeah. All the animals are talking to me. This is amazing. Uh, and I then you go into you the story. Her. Yep. <laughs> And like stab somebody through with your sword. And like it's just a fun it's just a funny game to me in that in that respect. I appreciate it for what it is, but it is just like a little It is a little if you, cognitive yeah. dissonance. One little, <laughs> totally. one little tidbit that was really cute that I don't know if you ladies have noticed is if you're just walking around and you don't you know, Jin's hands are just by his side, but if you walk through tall grass, he actually sticks his hand out and runs his hand mm-hmm. through the grass. Aww. Oh, oh it's wholesome so cute. boy. I don't know why, but I saw that. I'm like, oh my god, because it's nice. He's touching the grass. I he mean, like is going up to reach it and grab it as the birds are chirping and the wind is flowing. The gla- the glass. Hopefully, there's no glass. Grass is glowing. <laughs> oh. It reminds me of like this is a long time ago, but when I first saw like the original Division trailer or whatever and you walk up to like the side car door which is slightly ajar and he closed it and he closed the door and i was yeah. like oh, he closed the door <laughs> that was <laughs> a big moment. fucking deal though. i know that's what i'm saying and like i think that's kind of what britney is britney yeah. is having that same sort of moment but with Jin touching the grass as he walks through I'm like, that's such a cute moment <laughs> i agree he's my, husband. he's my my latest husband. you gotta appreciate mm. the little things because you know some programmer worked a long time on that yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Video games are magic, everybody. They really are. Well, I've hoped everybody has enjoyed this conversation about Ghost of Tsushima. Once again, thank you to Sony Interactive Entertainment for providing free promotional codes for the game. And now we're going to take one more quick break. And then when we come back, it's our Patreon produced segment where we're going to talk about the events that almost made us leave video games for good. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> we'll be right back. What's 
good, everybody? Welcome back. It's the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. And for our super fun third segment for this week. We got there. We're going to be <laughs> talking about something that we should have talked about in June. So apologies to all of our patrons. We should have gotten this up weeks ago. But she said. the world fucking happens. <laughs> That's what she said. Two? Maybe? Yeah. No. Doesn't work. Um, anywho, uh, you guys voted on a topic from one Javin Mather. Brittany, what does Javin want us to talk about? Javin wants to know, ladies, if there has been an experience that almost turned us off from working in games or caused us to take a significant break from playing them. Not gonna a very lo- lighthearted question. Yeah, no. <laughs> ja- Javin, listen. Let's talk. For a second... When Brittany told me this was what was voted on, because I saw this, I saw the voting happening on the Patreon page, patreon.com slash what's good games, if you would like to vote on what we talk about on the show. And I was like, boy, that seems kind of like a bummer topic. But apparently yeah. enough of you voted that you wanted us to talk about a bummer topic. Sure so here we are. <laughs> so yes, here we, we are. are. Indeed. But the thing that we decided was that some of our thoughts and experiences lead to some very like, oh, that happened kind of stories that we decided to proceed. So without further ado, we will get into the thick of it. (laughs) I know Simer has one for this. Yeah. So it's interesting to be like ever leave games. So I am probably one of the few people who's only ever worked in video games. Um, I left college, went directly to working in a PR firm that Xbox was my account. Ever since then, I've always, I've just always worked in games. Um, that doesn't mean that I haven't thought about leaving games. <laughs> it just means at this point, I'm entrenched. I'm in it for the long haul. Uh, <laughs> I do think one of the things that made me, the, the basically the job or uh, the grind that burned me out the hardest was IGN and reviewing video games because as I kind of mentioned when we were talking about Ghost of Tsushima it can be really taxing to just try and crunch through something not only are you trying to get through all the game content you're trying to have the mental space to think about it really critically you then have to write your review you then have to write your video review script you then have to capture all of your video review footage you then need to give all that stuff to the editor you need to go record your vo you have like there's so many different (laughs) things you need to do in order to hit that embargo um it can just really burn you out and so the one instance that i could think of where i actually was like i do not want to review games anymore and i need to leave editorial immediately was when i basically got i believe it was fallout was it new vegas i think it was new vegas um and I had to play it within 20. I basically, well, I didn't have to, but the review, they gave it to us so late um, that I ended up playing it 24 hours straight because we had a charity stream going on anyway. And Ooh. I stayed, I beat it. I beat that game in 24 hours. What? You beat wow. a follow game in 24 hours? It was miserable. Um, in one sitting? <laughs> also, not healthy kids. Don't play a don't game for 24 it. hours straight. Just don't do it. It was, and then after that 24 hours, I had to, again, write the review, write the video review, the script, like do all of that stuff. And I, it, oh, it basically broke me from that. Oh, God. <laughs> and you didn't um, get overtime, I bet. Oh, no, they didn't. No, they paid me Mm. almost nothing. And that's the other part that I always get really irritated with when I see people online being like, wait, Sony paid you or Sony paid you or whatever paid you to do this review. I'm like, no, they don't. They pay their (laughs) editors almost nothing. Like IGN pays their editors nothing. IGN has notoriously bad salary rates. Yeah. I made no money. I lived with four people. Like I I was broke. (laughs) Um, But you get to be paid to play video games christine i do except that's homework you have to go home and do that you don't do that at the office yep. you very rarely do that at the office and if you are doing that at the office it's you're capturing gameplay footage in a bay um so again so that somebody can cut together a video review for you um which means you have to strategically be placing your saves throughout that game and you have to be thinking about that so you can go back and get that <laughs> footage so that you can have something that looks good and like looks like it comes from different parts of the game not like just the beginning hour um <laughs> that's insane simer good lord it's yeah. a girl <laughs> it's a lot um and i think a lot of people don't really necessarily realize that 
going into it and i think that's why a lot of people you know throw stupid things around like you got paid to say this or whatever but no they don't they're barely getting they're barely getting paid enough to eat <laughs> so like well i mean leave and, them alone. and like i don't want to go too much down a rabbit hole of uh, of the unfair working conditions because like since you had that job to today Thankfully, it has gotten better, but obviously it's not where it needs to be and the protections aren't in place like they are in several other industries because there is this idea of you're still getting paid to play video games. It's not like you're laying sure. bricks. It's not like you're flipping burgers. It's not like you're cleaning bed linens in a hospital. Right? And like we get that. Like the, the work is not equal, but at the same time, the mindset of while you're playing a game is the it should be cast aside because it's not about the games it's about the fact that you're doing a job that somebody else is profiting off of and you're putting your blood sweat and tears into it and obviously losing sleep like a lot of people (laughs) do and for a long time like that was a big thing in the video games media business is that a lot of people who have to play games for review often noted that they would have to go home and keep playing this game because they couldn't obviously finish games in time for embargo in like however many days that they had. And they were like, well, I have to go home and play the, keep playing this game off hours, off the clock, because like, it's just what I got to do as part of the job. And like that part of it sucks. Oh, yeah. It's that's I mean, like I said, you very rarely are actually playing them at work. You almost never play the game you're reviewing at work. Very, very rarely would you play that there. You that's that is your homework. Like that's what you do in your evenings. <laughs> <laughs> um so anyways but yeah that's a whole other conversation for another day but that that incident in particular made me really want to get out of editorial and then eventually I obviously did um but yeah for the most part it was just like that sort of review grind just made games it made me it made me dislike games like no, games were no longer a fun escape for me it was very much real work uh and i and to your point of like yeah you're not laying bricks you're not doing whatever that is why they tend to still probably pay so low is because you can get a lot of really eager people in there to come and do the job that's not to say that they can do it well but they are willing to try <laughs> mm. very true yeah mm-hmm. so steimer I'm, I'm interested to know what brought you back obviously not to editorial specifically but just to like what brought back your love of games after that experience time like time heals all wounds. So I definitely, <laughs> I actually like, I did stop. So when I left IGN, I went to um, EA and when I worked at EA, I played almost nothing. Um, I mm. really kind of took a break for a little bit and I just did other things. And then slowly but surely <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that itch came back around where I feel like I had recovered enough from from that scar uh and then i was able to like be like oh well actually like i don't remember which video game it was but i'm sure there was just a game that was coming Dragon out Age that, origins mm-hmm. no that was way earlier um but there was it was probably yeah it was probably a dragon age or a mass effect or something that was coming up where i um was like really eager to play it and that's I was like oh, okay yeah i still like this and the reason i do this show is because it's not i mean it's ign very light right like you're not I'm not under the wire for this. I'm not like no one's breathing down my neck. Like, where's my video review script? <laughs> well, hopefully we, we, you never feel that way about us. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, I, I came back to like do this show because to me, I was like, this is a format in which I feel like I can talk about games, but not feel the strain or the crunch that I had as an editor. Yeah. And like, what's interesting about you saying that is that, we always wanted What's Good Games to be a place where we can talk about things that we're passionate about, but because we're small business owners that we can kind of run it how we want. And the unfortunate part for us is that there are a lot of cons to that, but the bonuses are we're much happier. And that the shit part about the way that digital media is as a landscape is that content creators are frequently forced to be workaholics and work themselves into the ground until they reach burnout in order to be relevant and successful. And it's super unfortunate that we haven't been able to grow as much as some of our counterparts is, but we've been able to stay happy and healthy and maintain a work-life balance, I think. Obviously, there's always exceptions, right? There are nights when 
Britt and I have to be up until th- 2 or 3 a.m. making sure the show gets uploaded. Um, that's just because publishers are rude and they keep putting things out on Thursday. <laughs> yeah, stop fucking having your press conferences on yeah. Thursday, you motherfuckers. Um, <laughs> but also, like, it, like, it's not like we're doing that every single week. And there are a lot of content creators that are doing that every single week. And there are, like you mm-hmm. mentioned, you know, reviewers who are working around the clock doing 15 to 20 hour days to, to meet an embargo. And... Then, you know, publishers are like, oh, we're only going to give you your video assets like 24 to 48 hours ahead of time because we don't trust you with our videos, but we trust you with our game code. And like, it's really fucking frustrating and it's hard. And Like, that's honestly like a challenge. And like, let me be clear. None of us at this table and none of the people that we work with are trying to be whiny or complaining about the positions that we have in the games industry. That is not what this is about. This is about us looking at it from a job perspective and saying, we have a job to do and we have a job that we're paid to do. and We're trying to do it to the best of our ability. And then we're put under extenuating circumstances almost all the time over situations that are wildly out of our control. And that wears you down. And it's tough because you get people from the outside going, oh, I can't believe that you're complaining that you have to get paid to play video games. And we're like, yeah, I get that. Like on the surface, that looks pretty shitty, but that's not it. I would love for someone from the outside to come in and try to like step into my shoes for the week and run the show. Step into Britney's shoes for the week and run everything that she does on social and the show. Step into Steimer's shoes for the week and be like, I got a full-time other fucking job and also do this. <laughs> step into Ree's <laughs> shoes and be like, I got a full-time other fucking job and step in and do this. And it's just like, it's not as easy as it looks from the outside. And that's the tough part is because so many of the consumers of our content, look at what we do was like, it's the dream job. And we're like, it's not actually as dreamy as you think. <laughs> it's still a job. It's still, yeah, I think that's the key, right? It's like, I, yeah. I feel like you hear a lot. And this conversation is slightly devolved, but that's fine. Um, you, you hear a lot of like, oh, if you do something you enjoy, you never really work a day in your life. And like, for me, in the, at least in my experience at IGN, found that to be horribly untrue. <laughs> because it basically turned the thing I loved into something bad for me it turned the thing yeah. I loved into a negative and that was the that was the thing right like yes I wasn't a doctor I wasn't like saving lives I wasn't working 24 hours in a hospital I get that my sister is a doctor trust me I'm aware of the comparative and I know that it's not as hard <laughs> those Christmas but, dinners man yeah you know like I get it I get it I am not unaware um but at the same time that was just what it was for me what it was is it turned my hobby into a thing I no longer enjoyed and for me, I didn't like that, right? Like, th- and maybe yeah. some people still do, and that's why they've been there. So, like, so obviously, every individual is different, and your experience is going to be different. But given that question, I was like, that that was the time, and that was the when I really thought, like, should I even still be here, or should I be doing this, or should I do something else in the industry? And that and that is and ultimately what I ended up doing was I just pivoted towards a different path. Yeah, that's good. Summer, I could listen to you talk all day, every day. Maybe, oh, girl. So, thanks. Um, the way you speak. I was telling you about so you, during your T. Lou two thoughts. You do such a good job. Anywho, so I've never actually worked for a company in the video game industry. Everything I've done has just kind of been on my own, building my own empire, if you will. So I've had the fortunate ability to kind of mandate what I do, what I don't want to do. So for that reason, I don't feel like I've ever been in a position where I felt forced to do something that I didn't want to do where I was like well because I for the most of this I had a side job that was completely unrelated to games so gaming wasn't like my only source of income or anything like that so it was more like of a hobby and if I wanted to work on it I would and going back to you know if you do what you love you don't work a day in your life there's definitely you were saying like definitely a difference to that you know for the Ghost of Tsushima video that I put up you know I was capturing footage at 1 a.m. for that and it had to go live six hours later you know but at the same time it was fun for me it's work but it's fun and I think that's kind of the difference and I think that's because I'm able to maintain that work-life balance if I was doing that video for another company you know getting paid pennies (laughs) <laughs> I, I don't think, you know, that would be something that I thoroughly enjoyed, but I love building what we have at What's Good with all of you ladies. And so therefore I find joy and inspiration in doing that. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. yeah. 
I think that so, it has a lot to do with not only your investment in what you're building, but also your passion, what you're doing. And I think a lot of people who work in games media frequently have, you know, thoughts of leaving games media to maintain, as Steimer said, their passion for games, because you don't just end up in games media if you're not a gamer, like you just don't. And mm -hmm. That is something that I think anybody who works in what we do has to re wrestle with and not just media, but also like in publishing and in production, because like friends of ours who are developers and who work in studios also have to balance that, right? Because they're like coding or doing art or doing production or design or whatever they do on their game for, you know, however many hours a day. And then they're like, well, when they get home, do they want to just sit down and play a different game? Or do they want to like disconnect and do something completely different? And I think that's why sometimes I really retreat into books or I'll retreat into TV and movies and I'll just put games down for a, like a while, like a beat. But, but doing what's good every week has really forced me to expand on that. And really like it's tough for us to take a week or two off when it comes to when I say off, I mean of playing new games or something different to talk about because we care so much about the show that we don't want to show up and go, I didn't play anything this week. I did that a lot at the beginning of the year. You, you, you did it <laughs> several times, but you didn't come to the show with nothing, though. You were like, I did this instead, or I was reading this, That's or I was true, doing yeah. this meditation. I was right? still being a human being in the world. Here's what I was up to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. But I think that sometimes, like, it, like, honestly, that is what's amazing about what we have at What's Good Games and what you guys as a community support us in, particularly the people who are – with us through thick and thin at on our Patreon page, right? And like, I know we talk about it all the time, but like what's good games could not exist without that. We could not, not feel that crazy pressure that Steimer talked about being under at IGN. If we didn't have that f support from you guys as people who want to hear our voices, because we then would have to be, you know, susceptible to those pressures of like, how many clicks do we have? How many impressions? Who do we have to do advertisements for? And, that is what makes doing something fun and passionate turn into something that feels like a chore and ultimately goes, this is too much. I'm leaving and walking away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Real, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Reed, yeah. did you ever, did you ever lose your passion for being a video game player? Or was there any point in your life where you're like, I just need to like step away for a while. I mean, here and there, just like when there's nothing that interests me at the time or when I'm, I'm just exhausted in general. Um, there are times when I'll put games down for a week or so. Um, there's other times when I'm playing a game that just is, is not what I want to be playing, um, which you all have been a front and center for recently. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I've, I've always loved working around games when I have been able to. So for, for folks who maybe didn't catch sort of like my my um, talks on previous episode where I told where I came from career wise, I used to be in healthcare. I bounced around here and there, but I've been in games for the last five and change years. And I don't see me leaving anytime soon because I'm in a space where I do have more of those protections because I am an employee at a consulting firm and we have specific work hours that we're allowed to work. We're specific, specific hours. We're not allowed to work. Um, there's a lot of oversight in how much we're putting in personal time and we aren't really able to do those 24 hour nights and, you know, get to a point where we're burning out because the, the company that I work with, um, specifically doesn't ever want that to happen. You know, they want us to be, um, productive and have longevity. So I do have the benefit of not really feeling that pain. And I know I would probably never will as long as I'm working where I'm working, um, but personally, I've stepped more into the sort of games media space working with what's good. And, and part of the reason why I agreed to when y'all approached me uh, later last year is that I knew that the space wouldn't let me burn out. And I think it's important to choose what you're working on and who you're working with very um, intentionally and with a lot of scrutiny, because it's very easy to let your passion sort of like it just completely take over everything that you would have done for self-care and Steimer you're like you're the perfect example like sometimes you need to step away from games and sometimes you need to read a book or journal or do something completely different in order to maintain your mental health 
And I think that's something that a lot of people in games media and honestly a lot of enthusiasts and just people who are our Patreon subs or people who are fans of games in general should really keep an eye on is like you don't want to do something so much that you hate it. And it's easy to get to that space when you're beholden to outside parties and you don't have that amount of control or oversight. And I know that that is not the case with what's good and that's why I feel so confident and so comfortable here and why I'm really excited to be a part of this team. Oh, oh we love that you're part of the team, Re. That was a nice warm fuzzy. I feel like we should end there. <laughs> we should definitely oh, end on the nice warm and fuzzy. Yeah. But I think like what you said just drives home the point that work with people who take care of you. Your company takes care of you and makes sure that the people that they work with are taking care of you. And I also hope that based off what you said, that What's Good Games is taking care of you and making sure that we're not asking for unrealistic expectations. And like there's a lot of companies out there that ask for unrealistic expectations. And it's tough because when you want to break into an industry, whether it's entertainment based or not, a lot of us are willing to sacrifice a lot to get there and I'm not here to stomp on anybody's drive I I did a lot of things for free early in my career and was really kind of used and abused as a as an employee like a lot of us are where we're trying to make our name in whatever industry we're in and it's tough because like sometimes it takes a long time for you to find your worth and find your voice to say like hey you're not respecting me as a part of this team you're abusing me and you're profiting off of me and not compensating me in whatever way that you want to be compensated so I think like what's interesting about games is that now we've had this conversation openly and hopefully we can continue to have the conversation and talk about like how do we protect workers not just people in on the dev side with unions but like people on the media side etc cetera, etc cetera. like overall like it goes back to the idea that we talk about all the time just be better to everybody Try to make people's go. lives better and like the world would be a better place. And that's the end of the episode. <laughs> All right, everybody. We hope you enjoyed this episode of What's Good Games. Don't forget we have a fantastic week of streaming lined up for you at twitch.tv slash what's good games. If you haven't followed us at the very least, go hit that follow button and sign up for notifications and you'll know whenever we go live. Until then, have a great weekend and we'll see you guys next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. <laughs>